welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm Dale. Uh, I'm your host, Dale, the Real Seeker. And today, um, so I'm not finished with the review shows, um, apparently. Uh, so I had a, another fan. This time it was an atheist fan. Uh, someone who's actually commented on some of the blogs. They're an atheist and a hardcore entrenched skeptic. Uh, she goes by the name Andrea, or I think she prefers the name Val. Um, otherwise known, she has a blog known as Club uh, Schoidenfreud. Yeah, and I'll include the links to that on my blog site. But um, she basically w was uh, doing her thing, um, kind of responding to Harry Stark's uh, show that I did, uh, review show number three, where he used his expertise as an actual world's expert biologist and scientist and uh, said that actually the scientific evidence proves that God exists on a balance of probabilities and he was going over various arguments for why he feels that so from the origin of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe, as well as um, arguments based on DNA and in biology and in, in that sort of sphere. And um, obviously, um, I'll call her Val because I think that's what she prefers. So uh, Val took issue with this and uh, kind of said, oh, this Christians, you're all lying. You don't understand science and all this kind of usual blah blah on the internet from atheists and skeptics uh, against innocent Christians and stuff like that. But anyways, uh, during that, uh, let's not poison the well here, she gave, she sent me a video, a debate that she did with famous Christian apologist Ray Comfort. And she's like, well why, you know, you posted up videos for Christians, um, I also posted up a video for a Muslim listener. Um, okay, well fair is fair, let me post up this video debate uh, for the atheists as well and give them a say on my blog. I'm, I trust my audience. You guys are smart enough and critical thinkers to listen to an opposing view and not be brainwashed by it. You can think, think it through critically and make up your own minds. So yeah, I wanted to play this debate, um, for you guys between, uh, Val from Club Schodenfreud's blog and versus, uh, famous Christian apologist Ray Comfort. I won't go into a full-scale review. There are just a few points that I wanted to go over. Uh, but before I, you know, poison the well or kind of give my take on what I th think about it, I'm just going to play it straight up in full for you guys uh, because I want you guys to make up your own mind first. Uh, and then I'll wait till the end and I'll give just some general feedback and critique as to what I think about the performance there. All right, enjoy the show. Ooh. Now we have picture and do we have sound? Yes, we do. Oh, that's great, Val. Nice, <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <clears throat> you've got good lighting, you've got a good background. You wouldn't believe some of the things that I see when people first come on. It's just this complete shadowed face. I say, well, can you turn the light off behind you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, dark and mysterious character. <laughs> so, um, where where am I speaking to? What state are you in? I am in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, just uh, north of Three Mile Island. Wow! Can you bring your camera down a little so there's less headroom? That's a little too far. That's a too far. Yeah. Better. Yeah, that's good. As long as you don't grow taller. As we speak. No. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> uh, so Pennsylvania or Pittsburgh near Pittsburgh? Um, it's about in the center of the state. I'm I'm originally from western Pennsylvania, uh, about two hours north of Pittsburgh, and uh, ended up out here. We're about two hours west of Philadelphia and the coast. Is it farm country or is it a city area? A uh, city. It's the state capital. Oh, okay. And how are you coping with the virus <laughs> uh, it's been interesting thankfully my husband uh, is a senior IT guy and uh, there's no lack of work for him because he works for the state wow that's wonderful um, I was thinking I wonder how many um, home sweet home plaques have been thrown in the trash uh, <laughs> quite a lot <laughs> quite yeah. a lot no place like home boy that is for sure. Anyway, it's a delight to meet you, and, and I, I'm sure we're going to have a great time. And if I say anything you don't agree with, feel free to jump in. I mean, 
um, you won't offend me. I'm used to people jumping on what I say, and it's a, it's a healthy way to, to have a talk. So tell me, are you an atheist? Yes, I am. Now, convince me to become an atheist. What are the benefits of atheism? Uh, it is um, basically the, um, there's uh, no particular benefit to it. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's the conclusion I reached after uh, reading the Bible and, uh, uh, you know, knowing a, a fair amount about science. So what is it that you read in the Bible that convinced you to become an atheist? Was it some of the Old Testament judgments? Joshua with the children of Israel taking out the uh, Canaanites? Uh, no, it, uh, some of that did. Um, I mean, after I read it, because uh, uh, it's uh, not very often that uh, uh, the pastors I grew up with uh, would mention anything except for the, uh, the pretty plain vanilla, fuzzy good Jesus parts of it. Uh, basically, um, I knew enough science to know that there was no such thing as a 28,000 foot deep flood and, uh, you know, went on through that. Uh, then I, you know, after I read the Bible, I saw where this God uh, killed David's son uh, to punish David, but, um, you know, didn't, didn't care about the child. And, uh, oh, you know, the, the, you know, the usual stuff that uh, you'll, uh, you know, hear from uh, various, you know, uh, non-Christians. So you're saying that the flood, the Noahic flood, which was said to cover the whole earth, wouldn't have covered Mount Everest, which is 29,000 feet. Um, do you realize there was no such things as mountains in those days? They hadn't pushed up? It was only there's no, that yeah, um, there's no evidence that uh, mountains are uh, that young. And there's, you know, I, uh, to try to claim that there was no mountains uh, requires quite a... Uh, energetic geology that would essentially uh, release so much energy that would uh, broil pretty much everyone on earth. Yeah, well, that's kind of what happened in the beginning. The mountains pushed up like uh, volcanoes do. Anyway. Um, um, all mountains are, aren't volcanoes. No, they're not, but they are made of stone or rock, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> We're talking about things I don't know much about, Val. Um, do you want to use that name, Val, or you, do you want to use your real first name? It doesn't matter. What's your real first name? Andrea. I'm not pleased with it. I think it's a great name, Andrea. <laughs> it just doesn't uh, satisfy my uh, particular uh, uh, aesthetic, so uh, I rather like Val. I got that from, uh, uh, I guess, probably originally from uh, the Mike Hammer book series. You know... You're not called Rotunda or anything. That would be a name to complain about. <laughs> oh, I get, uh, uh, let's see, Adrian and Audrey constantly. Oh, because people, yeah, Andrea. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what was the other thing? Um, there was the mountains, and the other thing that uh, you were saying was a problem? Uh, the, uh, basically, this god um, murdering oh. children, having no problem. Yes. Yeah, he killed David's son. Okay, did God actually kill, is it David's son? Or, yeah, David's son when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He didn't bless him with the child. He said the child's going to die. There are repercussions to his actions. Uh, but he let Solomon live, <clears throat> which is wonderful. Yes, and, uh, would you be um, happy if uh, someone killed one of your children and let the other one live? No, of course not. I love all my kids. Uh, then uh, why would you accept that from your God? Oh, because he's the giver of life. He's the giver and the taker of life. And he's the one that blesses with health and, and, uh, and life itself. And if, he's, if he deems fit to take a loved one, what can I do about it? I just trust him. I trust his integrity. So let's go back to that issue. David had a son mm -hmm. that died and God took him. And God says, your child's going to die. Um, did that actually happen? Uh, did, the, uh, did the resurrection actually happen? No, did David have a son that no. God killed? Uh, did, um, if that didn't happen, why should I think that the resurrection happened? Oh, no, I'm not talking about the resurrection. What I'm trying to get you to say is that, did God kill the son of David? Yes. So that's God what the, that's, what, that's what the Bible says. Yeah, it, but it God. didn't happen, did it? Because you're an atheist. 
So you say it didn't happen because God doesn't exist. So why are you upset about something that didn't happen? It's like being upset uh, about the fairy godmother turning Cinderella's coach back into a pumpkin. Well, let me ask you um, if, uh, let's just say that it did happen. Okay. And uh, you said that you would have absolutely no problem with uh, a God doing something you would be unhappy with a human doing, correct? Oh yeah, I'd be, I, I wouldn't be the happiest man on earth if one of my children died, but I know that God is the giver and the taker of life. He created every bone, every, every drop of blood in my children. He gave me the gift of children. And if he deemed fit that one of my ch children dies, I can't do anything about it, but I can trust him. I can trust him in it and say, Lord, you know what you're doing. You allowed this for some reason. It may not be a perfect will, but it's your permissive will. You permitted it. And in that I rejoice, I trust you because that's what faith is about. It's trusting when often, often things aren't right. So um, you, you believe you have a, an objective morality from your religion, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if, uh, if it's uh, not moral for a human to do something, why is it moral for your God to do it? Well, let me just take the scenario and bring some reality to it. Um, everyone's gonna die. Every single person's gonna die. And the Bible says why they're going to die. So why be upset about something that happened two and a half thousand years ago to another man's child and say, what about my neighbors down the road who've got children that have got cancer and they're dying? What about grandma? She's dying. Grandpa, my dog dies. My parents are going to die. I'm going to die. My husband's going to die. Why not ask that question and say, what is God doing? That yep. question has, has an answer. And that's the one you should pursue because the answer is incredible. Uh, why is your um, God um, allowing all these people to die whenever we, um, you know, we have this, let's say having the COVID virus. Uh, we have, you know, this God, you know, you say it's okay for this God to take anyone anytime it wants, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so your, your uh, morality is based on nothing more than might versus equals right. No, no, I don't think so. Um, I'm not saying God uh, allows people to die. God kills them. It says in scripture, the wages of sin is death. You, you remember that Bible verse, the wages of sin is death? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting that Christians can't agree on what sin is. Yeah, well, sin is transgression of the law. First John 3, 4. Every Christian I know agrees on that because scripture makes it very clear. Sin is transgression of God's moral law. Anyway, let's get back to it. The wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. You're going to die. I'm going to die because God is paying us in death for our sins. The wages of sin is death. He's given us the death sentence. We're victims of capital punishment justly. It's like a criminal, a court of law. He's committed heinous crimes, but he doesn't think they're serious. He says, judge, I am guilty. I cut the throats or I strangled, sorry, I strangled three prostitutes. They were the scum of the earth. I'm doing society a favor. The judge says, you may not think seriously about what you've done, but I certainly do. These are precious human lives. So I'm going to show you how serious I consider your transgression. You're going to the electric chair. And he pays him the wages of his transgression. He says, you've earned this. This is your wages. This is what you deserve. And God says sin is so serious in his eyes, not our eyes, but his eyes, that he's given us the death sentence. And that's how serious God is about sin, the death sentence. So if you're going to get angry at God for killing a child two and a half thousand years ago, Look at the whole of humanity and say, God, it's not fair. Everyone's going to die and you've given them the death sentence. And that should lead you to ask, why? And the Bible tells us why. Well, I, I know why, because this God doesn't exist and life ends thanks to the laws of physics. Are you sure so of that? I, hmm? Are you sure of that? Yeah. Well, this is huge news because... The whole world, to the whole world, death is a mystery. Science don't know what, doesn't know what happens after death, but you know, you're a, saying there's no life after death. Why would you come to that conclusion? I didn't say that. I said that, that death happens because the laws of physics require us, our bodies, to wind down. There's no reason to think that there's a life after death. Uh, uh, first, for uh, because um, humans have all sorts of different uh, ideas about what that is, and um, we've never seen a scrap of evidence uh, confirming it. Do you believe in the soul? Nope. You know, I was talking to a, a university professor, university professor at UCLA, 
And I said one thing that made him change his mind about the soul. I asked him the same question I asked you. I said, do you believe in the soul? And uh, he was a, uh, a, a biologist, a, an evolutionary scientist at UCLA. And I said, do you, he said, no, I don't believe in the soul. I said, do you realize the Bible uses the word soul and the word life synonymously? He said, really? He said, I believe in the soul then. Because obviously there is life within your body. Andrea, when you're a little four-year-old girl, you didn't look like you do now. You're a mature woman now, but mm -hmm. that many years ago when you were four, you, could look, you look completely different, but you're the same soul. You're the same personality. All that's happened is that you've gained no. experience and knowledge. No. The soul is looking out of your eyes. The soul is making your voice talk. It's making your brain work. And when you no. die, your soul passes on into eternity. That's why they say he passed on. You're going to pass okay. on into eternity. That's what the um, Bible teaches. Well, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't believe in the Bible. Uh, what's looking out of my eyes is the consciousness that my brain generates. Well, that's it. Your consciousness is your soul. That's not, but, but we have no evidence that it um, goes anywhere after the brain dies. Yeah, we do. Because the brain is dead because the life is left. Brain doesn't work when life leaves. Eyes don't work when the life leaves. When the soul leaves the body, everything says brain dead, heart dead, everything's dead because the life is left. That's yeah. what happens. Nope, you uh, seem to have your uh, the eggs before the chicken because the brain, whenever it shuts down, the consciousness ceases. Now, if uh, you want to uh, have something like dualism, uh, where there's a separate consciousness, soul, or whatever you want to, then we should be able to sense that and detect it because it's interacting with an electrochemical organ called the brain. Yeah, and there's no life to make it work and because the life has passed on. Now, you mentioned the chicken and the egg. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The egg. Are you sure? Yep. Was it fertilized? Uh, probably in some manner. Uh, we have some uh, evidence on how... Uh, uh, the unicellular things ended up being polycellular and then ended up being sexual uh, for reproduction. How did it get fertilized? From you, need, you need a male and a female to fertilize. So obviously the chicken came first, which laid the egg. And for no. the chicken to lay a fertilized egg, it had to be a male to fertilize the egg. That's how, that's the birds and the bees. Chickens and yeah. people were all the same. Nope, the eggs originally came from uh, reptiles, and whenever they uh, split off into dinosaurs, and then chickens came from the dinosaurs, and that's where the egg came from. Oh, Andrew, you've got blind faith to believe all that. The dinosaurs no. and chickens, I don't believe that. It's just crazy talk. Okay, let yeah, me ask another uh, just question. Just saying it's crazy talk uh, doesn't really help, Ray, unless you can um, show some evidence that uh, you, you know, uh, creationism works and uh, can uh, explain why uh, even Christians can't grip agree on uh, the creationism they want to pretend that exists. Oh, I, I think there's uh, disagreement in every sphere of society. Uh, no matter what, you, you, people disagree and husbands and wives disagree, politicians disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and Christians, uh, yeah, Christians oh. claim that uh, they all have the one real truth. Uh, what I need to see is um, evidence that uh, that is actually the case. Well, it's, it's provable. Um, now, let me ask you this question. What's that? How is it provable? We'll come up to that in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> Andrea, here's a question for you, and I ask atheists all the time, and maybe mm -hmm. you've heard me ask this question. Do you really believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything? That's not what uh, the Big Bang Theory says. It says that things came from a singularity, and we, right at this moment, we don't know what came before that. So the atheist believes there was no initial force, there was no initial cause. So do you believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything, including the singularity? Uh, we don't know that there was nothing. We could have been a force, but we, don't, we simply don't know at the moment. What we do know is that the, uh, the creation myths of Christianity and uh, a lot of different other religions have no evidence to support them. So you're not atheist, you're agnostic. You just don't know. No, I am quite an atheist. I know that, uh, you know, all the gods that, um, you know, men have invented in worship uh, don't exist. And uh, there could be some force, but that is not the god that you worship, is it? 
that is, it's the force in the beginning, the prime mover that created all no. things. Now, Andrea, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you want it to be God? Why would you say there could be a force in the beginning that created all things, it just wasn't God? Why would you say that? Why should I assume that, you know, the religion I grew up in was the correct one? Oh, well, you don't. You don't want to assume anything. This is your salvation. You've got to be sure. Mm -hmm. If you're going to jump out of a plane, you don't say, oh, I wonder which is the right parachute. You want the parachute that's going to work. And so that's what we're heading for today. So um, let's, move, let's move away from the rabbit trails because we're, we're going to run around and around them, you know, when we, talk about, <laughs> when we talk about creation and the prime beginning and atheism. I, I'd like to move away from your intellect. I'd like to talk to your conscience. Are you happy with that? Oh, sure. Uh, do, you think you're a, do you think you're a good person? Uh, I've heard you do this before. Uh, yes, I do think I'm a good person, and I do not use your Bible or your interpretation to define what good is. That's what we often do. That's what I did before I was a Christian. That's what Adolf Hitler did. Uh, no doubt if I talked to Hitler, he would say he was a good person because he had his own moral standard. He cleaned up Germany, got rid of brothels, brought in full employment, and got rid of the scum of the earth, cleaned the German race. And no yeah, a lot of uh, Christians think that he did a very good job. You can see that on the news with uh, the various Trumpies, really? thinking having no problem with uh, Nazism at all. You know what? Uh, if I were you, I wouldn't cover the whole church with one blanket because Jesus spoke of true and false conversions. He spoke of hypocrites. He spoke, yes. of, he spoke of fake Christians. And they're the ones that often speak the loudest. So don't sweep with such a bright, a, a, a broad broom. There are genuine Christians that believe the Bible, that love their enemies, that do good, they're kind to other people. They're not nasty. Mm -hmm. And if you find someone who is a professing Christian and they, they lack love, you can say to yourself, I don't believe that person's a genuine Christian. Oh, they're yeah, a Jews. Yeah, yeah uh, basically everyone, um, every Christian um, says this to me. My folks are still Christian. I, uh, I, they, they ask me questions about the Bible whenever they don't, don't know something, and I actually bought them a really nice version. Uh, the, um, you know, the, the idea, you know, I know Christians attack each other all the time. I grew up with a lot of anti-Catholicism in Western Pennsylvania. And again, you know, the actions of Christians, I can, you know, pull out just as many verses uh, recommending uh, abandoning your family, saying that all non-Christians deserve to die and deserve hell. Um, you let's know, just that, stop there. Uh, let's, let's deal with those two. The yeah. first one is abandon your family. Could you explain that to me? Uh, Jesus says you have to abandon your family to follow him. No, he didn't. He, yes, said, unless he, you, he said, unless you hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, in your own life, you cannot be my disciple. He didn't say to abandon your family. Yes, he says abandon your family. Uh, if uh, someone needs buried to walk away, everything oh, is required. Oh, I hear what you're saying. That guy yeah. said, he said, let me go and bury my father. And uh, it was tradition, tradition in those days. He was saying, I want to stay at home until my father gets old and dies. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. That's you not come what it Follow me. So that's what that's, he was saying. There's a lot that of... That's not what it says. Okay, well, to me it does because I understand tradition of the time. And there's a lot of things that we don't do understand. Too. Okay. So we are saying, you abandon your father, let him die, let the dead bury the dead. The other mm -hmm. one was the, unless you hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, and your, uh, your own life, you cannot be to my disciple. Yep. What do you think that means? Uh, the word hate's pretty obvious there. And what does it mean? It means that you have to um, wish them evil. You have to wish them and you have to abandon them. Exactly like I said. Okay, let me share my thoughts and see what you think. It's actually saying that the love you have for God, it's called hyperbole, a statement of exaggerations, a statement of extremes for emphasis sake. And Jesus was aligning love and hate for emphasis sake. Uh, the Old Testament often did it. He that uh, leaves his child without discipline hates his child. It's just saying you, you don't love your kid. And what he was saying is that your love for God should be so great because he gave you life that your love for your mom and dad, your brother and your sister should seem like hatred compared to the love that you have for the one who gave you that mother, father, brother, sister in your own life called hyperbole. That's, that's so, not what it says. And there's no indication that there was hyperbole meant in that case. Well, it's very obvious if you read it with a, with a searching heart. Um, 
and, and you, it, it's obvious only if you're reading it and hoping to make excuses for a god that is not what you the loving being that you would like to claim it is well let me tell you why i believe it's not hatred like you say despising your parents because jesus upheld the law honor your father and mother um if you hit your father or mother the bible says he put be put to death he said love your enemies do good to those that despitefully use you so mm -hmm. the same one who said, love your enemies, do good to those that despitefully use you. When he was crucified, he said, father, forgive them. They know what they do. No, not what they do. Why would he say, hate your mother and father? Obviously it's hyperbole. But if you want to believe he was really saying, hate your mother and father in contradiction of everything he lived for and everything he taught, well, that's your choice. And let's get back to the question. <laughs> let's get back to the question because we're going down a rabbit hole. Um, if you think you're a good person. Um, how do you measure up to those commandments? I don't care about your commandments. Yeah, but how do you measure up to them? I don't need to measure up to them. Well, let me ask you, let me, let me put you on the stand and see how you do. How many lies do you think you've told in your life? Um, I've told some and some were for good reason, just okay. like the, uh, the folks who uh, hit Anne Frank were aligned to the Nazis. Have you ever stolen something in your life? Even nope. if it's your no. you downloaded music off the internet that's not yours? No. Nope. Ever use God's name in vain? Uh, yep, and I don't believe in your God, and I think it's kind of a silly character, so I don't find that any worse than, um, you, know, you know, cursing by Krishna's name for, for all that matters. So would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. And my mother's not a magical being that's claimed to have uh, moral superiority over everyone. So why wouldn't you use your mother's name as a cuss word? Is it because you respect her? Yep, and I don't respect your God since I see no evidence that it exists. Boy, that's so honest of you and kind of you to admit that. The Bible says that you don't respect God, you hate him without cause, and that you're, you're in a state of enmity towards God, which is evidenced no. by the fact that you use his name as a cuss word to express disgust. What greater evidence of that enmity that you have towards your creator than the fact that you use his name as a cuss word? It means uh, nothing the, to you. The evidence that uh, it's part of my culture to use uh, your God's name as a cuss word to say, Jesus Christ, whenever it uh, seems to be uh, you know, appropriate in uh, uh, emotion, but uh, there is no particular hate there because the cuss word is essentially meaningless. Can you think of anyone in history who's had his name used as a cuss word like Hitler, Napoleon, or Mother Teresa? Anybody? No. And what exactly does that matter about your God that you can't show exists? Well, I'm just making a point, Andrea, that Jesus said why his name is used as a cuss word. He said this, it's in John chapter 7. The world hates me because I testify of its deeds that they're evil. And we hate God without cause for the same reason a criminal hates a police officer. No. A, police officer a police officer is often hated and even killed, not because of who he is, but because of what he stands for. And we hate God because he stands for righteousness and we stand for evil. And no, we, we your God is, um, I can demonstrate that your God is just as evil as anything, Ray. It works with Satan at least what, three, four times in the Bible. So I'm, you know, I'm not impressed with any claims that, you know, I'm evil because I don't like, you know, the character of your God. So you can't prove evil because you're an atheist. There's no such thing as good or evil. Yes, or there is. Well, explain to me where your, where your moral compass is. How do you My know compass right? comes from um, basically Western civilization that came from largely the Greeks and a lot of the ancient things. Um, I also, uh, we've gotten better over the years and uh, my personal more compasses are Captain Kirk and Captain America. So if you are governed by society, if society says, which is might is right, if society says- Might is right is not with society. Yes, it is. It's the majority rules. No, it might. isn't. Well, what is it? Might, might equals right is not majority rule. Majority well, rule. Well, is, democracy. Well, let's go back to it. If society says it's okay to kill Jews because they're not human, they're non human, and the Nazis are put in there by society, does that make it right? No. Why not? 
because I have my own moral compass. And the majority of the world, if you want to go with that, Ray, said that, um, you know, it, the Nazis were wrong and they spent a lot of lives uh, taking, uh, removing them from the world stage. So there's your moral compass. That's your God-given conscience, a society shape. Society shape, a God-given. The word conscience no. means with knowledge. And Ray, God's sure. given you light. He's given you understanding sure. so you can make moral no. judgments. No, the uh, idea of, uh, you know, moral understanding, the idea of do unto others has been around a lot longer than a bunch of uh, ignorant uh, agrarians from the Eastern Mediterranean. The whole concept was in China, was in ancient Egypt, um, Zor um, Zoroastrianism. It's nothing, um, you know, it's no surprise that a Christian would try to claim that his God is the source of all morals, but there's uh, no evidence to support that. Um, of course, that's been around. We know we've got that conscience. Every human being has that conscience. It's the inner light given to every man by his creator. It's so, not given by your God. There's nothing to show that. And we have the uh, evidence that even Neanderthals were taking care of their dead and their sick. So it has nothing to do with uh, some God giving, you know, a uh, moral compass whenever that God has a worse moral compass than most modern humans. Okay. So, um, Andrea, what did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to end up in hell, according to the Bible? Do you know? According to the myth, this God um, intentionally or couldn't keep Satan out of uh, Eden. He didn't let uh, Adam and Eve know what good and evil is. After a few thousand years of trying with a flood and with laws, uh, this God uh, seems to have decided that it needed a blood sacrifice by uh, torture to make itself happy and to forgive people for what it essentially did in the beginning. Boy, you know, if I was, if I had that theology, I'd be an atheist. Now, this is what happened. That's why I'm an atheist. <laughs> yeah, because it's bad, it's bad theology. It's a, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding of Scripture. Scripture uh, tells us, the Scripture yeah, tells us, let me, let me share this and then you can give your thoughts because <laughs> when we over talk each other, it's very confusing. So I'll, I'll let you chat and you let me chat. Um, Andrea, the Bible says God is holy and righteous. He's nothing like we imagine him to be. He's not the old man reaching out to touch Adam's finger. Um, he is the maker of all things as every building has a builder. Every painting has a painter. Everything made has a maker. And God is intimately familiar with you as a person. As you know, he knows how many hairs are on your head, he knows how many thoughts are in your heart, he knows what you're thinking, what you're doing, and he's even familiar with every atom that makes up that eye. He's intimately familiar with the atom because he made that atom, that intricate atom. And the Bible says his wrath abides on you because of your sin, and he's given you the death sentence. That's how serious sin is to God. But at the same time, he's rich in mercy, and God became a human being, a perfect sinless man, Jesus of Nazareth, who then gave his life on the cross to pay the fine for the law that you and I broke. The Ten Commandments, as you know, are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. That means God can legally dismiss your case. As a judge can dismiss the case of a criminal that's violated road rules because someone paid his fine, and do that which is legal and right and just. God can take the fear of death off you, the power of death off you. He can <laughs> release you from the death penalty because of what Jesus did on the cross and paying the fine and then rising, rising from the dead. And all you have to do to find the truth is obey the gospel. I'm not trying to convince you of the Bible. I'm not trying to convince you there aren't nasty people who call themselves Christians. I'm not trying <laughs> to convince you of Genesis chapter one. I'm just saying, hey, believe the gospel. It's very simple. God's which made gospel? a decision for you to have God's made provision for you to have everlasting life. If you repent and trust in him for your salvation, you'll forgive your sins and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. And you did it. You let me speak. And for that, I'm very grateful. So did you want to say something? <laughs> to that? Hey, there's no evidence for anything that you said. I don't, I am not afraid of death. I uh, don't think that, uh, I think it's uh, morally reprehensible to expect someone to pay for my sins. And uh, I just uh, find the whole concept of Christianity just to be, um, you know, a, a terribly un, you know, strange religion with the, um, you know, the, the, the idea that, um, 
you know, sac or sacrifice is needed um, of this perfect supposed person uh, when, uh, if I did something wrong, I expect to be uh, held responsible for it. Well, that makes me shut up. Um, you don't realize this, but I like you very much. I care about you and where you spend eternity. And the thought of God giving you justice for your sins takes my breath away, brings tears to my eyes. And all I can do is plead with you. Just soften your heart, Andrea, please. Your parents love you. I love you. Christians love you. And we take no pleasure in your death. We take no well, pleasure in your damnation. We want to see you in heaven, not in hell. So, okay, well, uh, Ray, your uh, Bible in uh, Romans 9 says that your God picks and chooses who can accept it and who can't, and that it damns those who that it chose not to be able to accept it. So I just might be one of those people that, um, you know, your God decided that uh, I had no free will and I have no choice in the matter. You know, predestination is often confused with God having foreknowledge. I can watch a Super Bowl, know who wins, and come home, look at the television, and say to my friend, as we watch this, I know exactly what's going to happen. And it's the same with God. He knows those who will harden their heart and be no, dead. That's, and that's not what it says. says. You know, you know let, me, let me explain predestination for you. because <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Presbyterian, Ray. I've already heard this. <laughs> yeah, but you may not have heard this. And it helps me understand the thing, because if you're, what you're saying is true, then God is unjust. So let's just, let's just let, me, let me give you my perspective. The Bible says we are so sinful, so rebellious, that it takes God's grace for us to be saved. He grants repentance to the acknowledging the truth. Whosoever will may come is the promise of Scripture. God opens up to the whole of humanity. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, whosoever comes to me, I'll in no wise cast out. So the scriptures make it very clear that salvation is universal to the whole of humanity. And if you harden your heart, God will give you justice. He won't give you repentance. He'll leave you to your own free will. And you're choosing hell, not heaven. And that's not God's will. Neither is mine. And that's why I'm pleading with you today. That's, uh, but you might have to talk to Paul because uh, that's exactly what he says is I have no choice in the matter. And Jesus also said that he took, used parables to make sure that some people couldn't accept him. Yeah, you know what that's about? The Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Jesus said, I thank you, O Father, that you've hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. So if you refuse to have a humble seeking heart, you'll never find the truth. You open a Bible and start looking for things that you can do to accuse God of moral discrepancies, you'll never find the truth. But if you've got a humble searching heart and say, God, I'm gonna die. I need you to I need you to live, and I know you're rich in mercy and you're lover of my and you're the lover of my soul. Please lead me into all truth, and he will. He's faithfully promised. He says, If you seek me, you'll uh, find me. If you search me with your whole heart. Let me finish that. He said, If you seek me, you'll find me. If you search me with your whole heart. So remember that God resists the proud gives grace to the humble, and a proud person doesn't realize they're proud. They're blinded by their own pride. So search your own heart and say, is, is, have I got a proud heart or am I humbly seeking truth and wanting to please the God that gave me life? I was, um, whenever I first read the Bible, uh, the, I was um, in the midst of losing my faith. And so I prayed and asked this God to uh, help me. And uh, this has been a oh, handful of decades ago. Uh, this God did absolutely nothing, Ray. So uh, trying to blame the uh, victim doesn't really work here. Okay, let me answer that. God sometimes takes his time. The day to the Lord is a thousand years to us, and God is answering that prayer today, and I'm trying to help you to restore your faith. So you thank God that he chooses the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. He speaks through donkeys, and he's speaking through me today and telling you that he has no pleasure in your death, and he's answering your prayer, and he wants to restore your faith. Okay. Um, other Christians have told me the same thing, although somewhat different because, um, you know, Christians have their own invention of what this God wants. And uh, to try to claim that it, your God takes decades to answer a prayer, that doesn't work with the Bible either, since it, uh, it says that basically knock the door shall be opened. It doesn't say uh, wait until you're late middle age to uh, hear from someone doesn't tell you how quickly the door will open. It just says, knock and it shall be open. Sometimes God takes his time. Scripture makes that very clear. The, the scripture says that uh, the knock and the door shall be open because the person is not going to let the, the, uh, the person in the house doesn't let the, uh, the visitor stand outside. 
well, keep knocking, Andrea. God loves you. I love you. I care about you and your parents love you. And I want to thank you for your, uh, the fact that you're a good sport and you, you let me speak. And I, I trust that you're going to think about what we talked about today. Will you do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've uh, spent a long, long time doing this. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, we'll be in contact. Um, we don't usually do it, but I'm going to send you the link to this. Uh, yeah. So you can have your own copy because you requested that. So yeah, thank you please. again. I really appreciate talking to you. And it's been nice to meet you and give my love to your parents. Yeah. And uh, we had this today because of their prayers. God bless. Okay. See you, Ray. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. So um, basically, uh, that's, that's it for their discussion. Uh, very short, uh, very informal. Um, and I guess just by way of general feedback, uh, so I think both Ray and uh, Vel did a decent job for what this conversation was. I mean, it's a 37 minute conversation. Um, the problem with these types of things, very superficial. It, it seemed like there was a lot of just talking past each other. Um, and it was, you know, one point to the next. I mean, there was about a dozen points mentioned um, to which, you know, either side just provides quick counterpoints in the form of superficial conclusions or negations, you know, Bell would just say, no, it's not, or something like that, and leave it, leave it at that, or make a claim uh, to counter uh, Ray and vice versa. Um, we didn't get the depth of like, okay, well, let's pick one issue and let's go back and forth on it for a little bit and try to get to the bottom of the truth. Um, yeah, I'm not going to fault either Val or Ray for this, because obviously this is just kind of a informal discussion that took place, uh, set up by Val's parents. Uh, I gather from that that Val's parents are deeply committed Christians and they're concerned about uh, Andrew going to hell. Um, so they somehow they have connections to Ray Comfort and so they set this up and Ray was kind enough to spend some time to actually address uh, some of Val's um, uh, issues here or, or problems as to why she is an atheist. And yeah, for, for what it is, I, I think both sides responded to the points that were brought up and gave their kind of counterpoints, but um, there wasn't a heck of a lot of depth uh, provided beyond just them asserting their conclusion about the point. And because of that, there was a lot of talking past each other and stuff like that. So that's my only real complaint about this is there, there wasn't enough depth uh, to get to the bottom of why these two disagree on us, any specific issue. And obviously with that, I mean, it's not gonna do any good. Um, obviously Val is still here, a hardcore entrenched skeptic, uh, calling me and innocent Christians like Carrie Stark uh, liars to this day, right? So uh, it did nothing for her. Um, and Ray's mind is probably the same. He, he wasn't influenced in any way. So yeah, that, that's my only complaint about it. But otherwise, I would say it was pretty polite. Um, stylistically, for the most part, they both took their turns um, and let the other speak. So that was good. Um, and they responded, you know, point counterpoint, um, even if only on a superficial level, at least they weren't just bringing up totally random things. Um, they did respond to each other uh, before moving on to the next point. So that's it by way of general feedback, I would say. Um, now, there are a few points, specific points uh, about the discussion that I wanted to raise and provide my feedback on by way of a review. So the first kind of related to my general feedback about, you know, just superficial claims countering each other. Um, and I find that this is um, something that comes up a lot with atheists and skeptics. So Val is mentioning modern science, Christians, they're liars, they're, they're stupid, they don't, they're ignorant of the science. And she, she brings up a specific example, a couple of examples and that sort of thing. And this was something that I, from the flood, as well as she briefly hints at the Big Bang. So these are, the, this is the first illustration I want to give of this, where it's, I think that the skeptic uh, here, um, is obviously taking advantage. Ray, Ray admits, look, he's kind of ignorant. He doesn't know how to debate the details. And so this atheist uh, is just kind of asserting, no, well, that's not true because 
it would produce such and such or whatever. Um, now, I will say this for Val, because I actually looked into it. I wanted to see, look, she, she bring, let, okay, let me shut up. Let's play, let's just play the clip uh, where she talks about these things. So first starting with her flood, with the flood. What did, what did they say about this? Uh, it's uh, not very often that uh, uh, the pastors I grew up with uh, would mention anything except for the, uh, the pretty plain vanilla, fuzzy good Jesus parts of it. Uh, basically, um, I knew enough science to know that there was no such thing as a 28,000 foot deep flood. And, uh, you know, Okay, uh, so sorry about that, uh, a little bit of a glitch. Okay, so we're gonna pick up with the recording on the scientific bit. So let's play that part of the video. It's, it's the conclusion I reached after uh, reading the Bible and uh, um, you know, knowing a, a fair amount about science. So what is it that you read in the Bible that convinced you to become an atheist? Was some of the Old Testament judgments, Joshua, children of Israel, out no, uh, no it, uh, some of that did. Um, I mean, after I read it, because uh, uh, it's uh, not very often that uh, uh, the pastors I grew up with uh, would mention anything except for the uh, the pretty plain vanilla, fuzzy good Jesus parts of it. Uh, basically, um, I knew enough science to know that there was no such thing as a 28,000 foot deep flood. And uh, you know, went on through that. Uh, then I, you know, after I read the Bible, I saw where this God uh, killed David's son uh, to punish David, but, um, you know, didn't, didn't care about the child. And, uh, oh, you know, the, you know, the usual stuff that uh, you'll, uh, you'll hear from uh, various, you know, uh, non-Christians. So you're saying that the flood, the Noah flood, which was said to cover the whole earth, wouldn't have covered Mount Everest, which is 29,000 feet. Um, do you realize there was no such things as mountains in those days? They hadn't pushed up. It was only yes, no, up the yeah. um, There's no evidence that uh, mountains are uh, that young. And there's, you know, I, uh, to try to claim that there was no mountains uh, requires quite a... Uh, energetic geology that would essentially uh, release so much energy that would uh, broil pretty much everyone on earth. Yeah, well, that's kind of what happened in the beginning. The mountains pushed up like uh, volcanoes. Anyway, um, um, all mountains aren't, aren't volcanoes. No, they're not. But they are made of stone or rock. I don't know. <laughs> We're talking about things I don't know much about. Well, um, Okay, so, so that's it for that part of the clip. You can see, obviously, look, there is claim, counterclaim, uh, and then another claim, uh, and then a counterclaim to that kind of embroiled here. So this, this does kind of, uh, and I went to check Val's blog. Uh, she does write a blog on this where she gets into certain specifics. Uh, I couldn't find anything on her blog about this heat issue, but look, her first complaint is just a superficial claim, uh, unnuanced, and just says, look, the flood couldn't have happened because why? Uh, well, the flood couldn't have been over 20, 29,000 feet to cover Mount Everest, a typical fundy lay atheist and skeptical objection against young earth creationism. And uh, Ray Comfort comes back with the proper response, which is, look, no idiot, no young earth creationist is that stupid. We don't believe that Mount Everest existed in the first place. So the floodwaters didn't have to be 29,000 feet uh, because there was no mountains that were that high in those days, um, or even mountains at all kind of thing. So they come up with creation flood models that account for the formation of mountains like Mount Everest as a result of a global flood. So that's what the counter response there is. Um, and Andrea is aware, perfectly aware of this, right? She, she knows about the different models. She referenced them, references them in her blog. So, um, in point of fact, I think Val probably has a deeper knowledge than Ray Comfort, because Ray self-admits, look, he, he doesn't know how to get into the details. He doesn't want to get too specific. Um, so yeah, if we're getting into, if we are looking at the details, I think that Val would win on this counterpoint. Um, and in fact, 
I personally agree. I'm an old earth creationist, right? So I don't agree that there was a global flood and I would probably agree with your point. But Andrea brings up uh, two counterclaims to this response, counter response of Ray, right? About, well, there were no mountains. The flood is what formed the mountains um, during the global flood. And she says, well, number one, we know for a fact that the mountains aren't that young. They're not sick. They're not 5,500 years old. Um, and they were formed long before that. Again, uh, no response is given by Ray and no proof of this claim is given by Andrea at all. Um, and that just comes down to the format of the discussion. I'm not faulting anyone, but it's again, it, it's just a claim. Well, how do you know that, right? And we would need to get into those details. Secondly, the second thing is interesting about the level of heat, the level of energy that would be required if, this, if the young earth creation flood model is true, uh, that would produce so much heat, it would boil the water, oceans, it would cook everyone alive. Noah could not survive. Um, that amount of energy that would be required and would be released if there were a global flood uh, in accordance with young earth creationist models. But again, no details or proof is given. This is just a skeptical claim. Um, and again, that's, look, that's a fault. Ray, Ray wasn't, isn't um, knowledgeable enough to uh, tackle that issue. And because of that, it just kind of ends. We just have this unsubstantiated skeptical claim. Uh, again, it's a claim I think Val is probably correct with, um, but there was no nuance given. Um, and in fact, young earth creationists themselves uh, are well aware of this point, ones that are knowledgeable. Uh, and able to address this issue. I mean, there have been peer-reviewed scientific journals addressing this heat issue. Uh, so let me just bring up uh, some of what they say. I'm going to be uh, linking in my blog to some of these papers because I think it's important to see the other side, to see the nuance that goes into this. Um, Okay, so one thing that I want to say about this is there, there is this thermal heat boundary layer. So this is why I think Val definitely knows her stuff or has at least uh, looked at what the skeptical side is saying. It's, it's unclear, again, given what's in the show, it's unclear how much she knows about the nuance and what the actual experts that are young earth creationists are saying about the heating issue uh, in terms of a global flood because obviously they're aware of this and they've actually scientifically quantified uh, this uh, scientifically using real data and stuff like that. So you can see um, a couple papers that I'll be including. Look, there has actually been scientific modeling of a global flood and the post flood using ocean floor cooling. Uh, so obviously you need some sort of um, cooling mechanism, a powerful, very powerful cooling mechanism that was present at the time of the flood that would have allowed, prevented the um, oceans from boiling over and all life from uh, reaching, you know, the earth from reaching temperatures that would have killed Noah and his family and all the animals on the ark and stuff like that. And they know where this boundary is from studying um, the oxygen 18 content in uh, marine fossils, for example, in shells or um, uh, stuff like that. Or they've seen that the Geologically speaking, the, the ocean floor temperatures never exceeded 13 degrees Celsius hotter than it is today. Uh, so therefore, the, these represent these thermal boundary conditions, right, that young Earth creationists readily admit. Now, the reason why I think uh, the fact that Vell mentions this issue um, with Ray uh, suggests that she does have at least some kind of interaction with that actual experts is because, look, not only do the young earth creationist scientists recognize this, but they say, look, even the models that we have are problematic. They don't work. They're not fully physically consistent with the laws of physics. Uh, some people require, you know, the Institute for Creation Research, when they talk about this heating issue, they readily admit and say, well, there is some sort of supernatural aspects, aspect or aspects, plural, at play that cooled down the planet at this time. Or um, 
look, even these guys admit in their 2018 paper, um, where's the line that I'm looking for? Uh, so they're saying, look, uh, <coughs> their results of their modeling failed. It was unsuccessful to work. Um, it enhanced heat conduction is physically unrealistic and delivers an overwhelming heat load to the oceans, thus requiring two extraordinary changes to normal physics. Uh, so again, that's hinting, well, maybe God did something supernatural. And it, as Bible-believing Christians, we have no problem with this. Um, so unless you have an anti-supernatural bias, like perhaps Val does, then only then would you have a problem. Um, but you know, an anti-supernatural bias means that you're irrational, you're illogical. Um, we're not restricted to that. Um, however, I would say that it raises issues. Even if you don't have that bias, okay, well, if we're having to posit ad hoc supernatural things, everything is physically consistent to a point, but there are supernatural elements involved. Okay, well, at what point does that become improbable on an ad hoc basis? You might ask, that issue might come up and that could be, you know, someone like Hugh Ross would probably say that like, um, well, you've got to, these guys are admitting you have to have at least two extraordinary changes to normal physics, at least two supernatural miracles in order to uh, get around this impasse about the thermal boundary um, condition of the heat and stuff like that. So yeah. Um, the fact that Val mentions this issue, I think, suggests that, yeah, there's a deeper knowledge. She knows that this heat issue is something that even the young Earth creationist scientists themselves are struggling with at the moment, and they're coming up with models and trying to work, come up with some in situ cooling mechanism that can uh, account for it and that sort of thing. So the fact that she brings that up, uh, I wish, I wish. Uh, suggests that there's some some level of knowledge. So I will give her that. I think she gets the point uh, on this front. Um, I wish Ray Comfort, you know, uh, was able to address it in more detail and maybe they could have gone back and forth a little bit better on the details, but fair enough. The, the point that I'm wanting to mention here as a critique for Bell is, look, there's no nuance in what you presented. You, I mean, you're not being fair to the young earth creationists. And I'm saying this as an old earth creationist, I'm on your side, I don't believe they're was literally a global flood scientifically. I, I think that the evidence does make it um, improbable overall, very improbable that there was a global flood. But nonetheless, I mean, pretending that young earth creationists are just idiots and that they've never, uh -huh, a heat problem, a heat boundary, what are you talking about? We, we've just never considered that. No, they're not, these are the world, these are some of the world's experts in geology and in physics and stuff like that. And, they know all about this issue and they are tackling it. So I think showing some nuance and fairness, um, even with those we disagree with and think are wrong, um, you know, just dismissing them as idiots would be wrong or liars. That's your favorite thing, right? Um, yeah, no, we, we've got the young earth creationists do engage in credible scientific work um, even if they come out to the wrong conclusions at times. Um, okay, so the other thing about the science uh, is about the Big Bang Theory. So I think this, let's play that part. And, uh, explain why uh, even Christians can't gr agree on uh, the creationism they want to pretend it exists. Oh, I, I think there's uh, disagreement in every sphere of society. And no matter what, you, you, people disagree and husbands and wives disagree, politicians disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and Christians, uh, yeah, Christians oh. claim that uh, they all have the one real truth. Uh, what I need to see is um, evidence that uh, that is actually the case. Well, it's it's provable. Um, now, let me ask How? you a question. What's that? How is it provable? We'll come up to that in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> Andrea, here's a question for you, and I ask my atheists all the time, and they mm -hmm. they've heard me ask this question. Do you really believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything? That's not what uh, the Big Bang Theory says. It says that things came from a singularity, and we, right at this moment, we don't know what came before that. 
So the atheist believes there was no initial force. There was no initial cause. So do you believe a scientific impossibility that nothing created everything, including singularity? Uh, we don't know that there is nothing. We could have been a force, but we don't. We simply don't know at the moment. What we do know is that the uh, the creation myths of Christianity and uh, a lot of different other religions have no evidence to support them. So you're not atheist; you're agnostic. You just okay. So so that was it. That was mentioned about the Big Bang. As people know, I I've done an in depth series here, and Andrea or Val is, is saying. Look, uh, you know, atheists don't necessarily believe that nothing created every created something, created the universe and that sort of thing. All we can prove empirically and scientifically is that the universe uh, started at the very most at a point of singularity, at or before the point of singularity, as proven by the BVG singularity theorem or the Hawking Penrose singularity theorem. Uh, and suggested by the empirical evidence from the cosmic microwave background radiation, redshift data, um, abundance of light elements in the universe like helium and hydrogen and that sort of thing. Um, so I guess, I guess I would just want to say, because not so much based on this video, but just from my interactions, uh, you know, Val's reaction to Harry Stark's video and to my work on the cosmological argument, there's this notion that atheists and skeptics, again, it goes back to this point of provide, having an unnuanced atheistic understanding of Christians and thinking that we're all just country bumpkins who don't understand basic cosmology or science. Um, when in fact we do, and probably better than most internet atheists and skeptics, uh, not saying necessarily all of them, and I'm not necessarily saying um, in response to Bell. Again, I, I don't have enough information about Bell to make that judgment yet. Um, but I would just say there has to be this principle of charity where you look at what Christians are actually saying and, and the specifics, right? So you can't just give, oh, well, because they rely on the BVG singularity theorem, um, they must not understand. They must be claiming that um, the universe is absolutely 100% degree proven to be, to have begun to exist at or before the moment of a singularity. Um, no Christian uh, in the know actually says that. That's not what Dr. William Lane Craig says or uses Alexander Vilenkin's quotes for. We, we understand and present the nuance, right? We understand that there are certain conditions. With the BBG singularity theorem, the reason why it's so powerful is there's only one assumption. Uh, and that is the fact that the universe is on average in a state of cosmic expansion. If that assumption is true, absolute proof the universe began to exist and the universe is defined of all physical uh content all of space and time and its uh contents physical contents um so therefore there is that would support ray there is literally nothing physically speaking um that quote unquote before the singularity point uh, it's just definitionally impossible. So that's that's where I think Ray gets this notion of saying that atheists have to believe nothing created everything. And that would be true given that definition of the universe. Now, obviously what atheists uh, in the know do is they'll, they will deny one or more of the assumptions of these singularity theorems. So with the BVG singularity theorem, they will deny and say, look, I don't believe that on average, the universe is in a state of cosmic expansion. They'll say maybe there was a prior phase. So the universe is in a state of expansion today as we observe it. Absolutely, I'm not a fool, I can't deny that. But there was a prior contraction phase so that perhaps on average, um, the universe is in a state of cosmic contraction. These are infinite contraction models. Uh, or a lot of other models, like the asymptotically static model, for example, eternal cosmological model. They'll say, well, on average, the universe is in a state of cosmic neutrality. It's neither expanding nor contracting. It's equal. It's static overall on average. Uh, so those are the some of the ways that you can get out of that uh, and escape um, the BVG singularity theorem, which is a proof 
that the universe began to exist at or before a moment of singularity, of infinite density, infinite heat, all of that good stuff. Um, but yeah, cr Christians understand this. I mean, I myself understand this perfectly. And I went into exquisite detail. I did about six hours just on the scientific evidence in my cosmological argument, part 3A and part 3B. And I went over every single model that is known to exist to date, including uh, looking at the world's experts and scientific peer review papers and looking at both sides. And I proved or provided my reasoning, at least, if you think my reasoning is inadequate, but I provided my reasoning as to why I think all of the eternal cosmological models proposed are improbable relative to the model of the universe, the modified Big Bang hypothesis or model, which states, no, it, the universe did begin to exist. Quote, unquote, before that, there was nothing. There was only God. Um, and I provide absolute uh I provide my proof for that on a balance of probabilities. Um, so I find that's that's the only thing, again, my main point here is that atheists and skeptics, they need to be more nuanced and charitable when addressing Christians. They gotta stop pretending that we don't understand things that we do. Um, you know, we, we don't just have this simplistic understanding all the time. Um, and we're not lying when we say there is proof. There is proof on a balance of probabilities that the universe began to exist. Yes, there are eternal cosmological models that have been proposed that, that are possible and physically plausible, but that doesn't mean they're equally probable and or more probable than proposing the universe began to exist. And that's what the atheist really needs to do. That's what the Christian is claiming is that no, it's more probable relative to the that the universe began to exist is true over and against that one of one or the eternal cosmological models is true. That's what we're now, son of a gun. That's what we're claiming. Um, and there just seems to be no recognition from internet atheists and skeptics that that's what apologists like myself or Dr. William Lane Craig uh, are actually arguing for. Um, and we need some of that nuance. So that's my first point. That took a heck of a long time. I'm gonna shut up and move on to the next point. Um, but yeah, uh, I just want to say we need more charity and nuance and a, an, a, an attempt to interact seriously with those we disagree with. I mean, pretending that, I, look, I'm against, I disagree with young earth creationists. I'm on your side. I, I do think that the heat, the thermal boundary conditions is an issue that falsifies on a balance of probabilities or plays a role in a cumulative case in falsifying young earth creation uh, global flood models. Um, and Andrea knows about the various models. She, she talks about some of them in her blog and she links to the talk, uh, talk Origins paper, which I'll be linking to in my blog, that discusses about three of three different models, catastrophic plate tectonics, Walter Brown's, Walt Brown's uh, hydroplate theory uh, model, uh, Kent Hovind's uh, vapor canopy type model. Um, but yeah, we, we need to um, go beyond just the talk, the superficial talking points and realize these people are aware of these problems and have engaged with them, whether they've done so persuasively or not, or sufficiently or not. Uh, well, that's up to us to evaluate, but just pretending like, oh, well, they're just idiots that don't even recognize that there would be this heat problem that's dishonest on the part of atheists and skeptics, I think. Um, so yeah, uh, shutting up and let's move on to the next point here. Actually, uh, in that clip already, I don't have to, to save time. There's a second major point or theme that I wanted to mention here that I uh, find a little bit of a pet peeve among internet atheists and skeptics like Bell. Um, and uh, so, and this is the point of, using Christians with disagreeing opinions to refute other, to refute the Christian you're talking to. And I find this is so intellectually lazy, dishonest, and uh, quite frankly, uh, disgusting uh, when internet atheists and skeptics use this as a tactic. And I, I encountered this all the time with people like David Johnson on S SNS or Darren Lute or all of those guys, they always love to 
hmm, let me just turn my brain off and not consider the point you're saying and just say, duh, but John Smith is a Christian and he disagrees. You must be wrong. <laughs> uh, horrible reasoning. This is the stupidest thing and it's annoying. I, I, I loathe when atheists and skeptics think that they're raising a point by saying, yeah, but uh, Bob, Bob down the road disagrees with you and he's a Christian, so therefore there must not be a truth to this. And, and Andrea kind of raises this issue a few times in this uh, talk, right? She kind of, she mentioned that, well, yeah, but Christians can't agree. She mentions later on, yeah, but Christians don't agree on what sin is. And uh, she mentions um, something, another issue. Uh, she also mentions Calvinism towards the end of the debate and says, well, people disagree. Now, here's what I want to say about this point, because on the issue of Calvinism, Val actually does a great job. I was applauding. There's my little applause, uh, because Val does what atheists should be doing. If you want to say that I'm wrong in my biblical interpretation, you don't point to John Smith or to polls that say, well, the majority of self-proclaiming Christians are for gay marriage or for uh, or they're Calvinists, or something like that, totally meaningless, irrelevant foolishness. Don't give a darn. Um, but what Val does in terms of the Calvinist issue is she points to, look, I've got evidence, biblical evidence. The Bible is the authority. We should, atheists and skeptics need to do the work. They can't be intellectually lazy, uh, little hypocrites. They need to say, I don't care what Christians say, I'll listen to their interpretations and take that on board, but I'm going to consider that in light of the authority. What's the authority for all the Christians? It is the Bible. So therefore, the question is, if I want the truth about a doctrine, does the Bible teach Calvinism or not? And Val brings up Romans chapter 8, verse 9, uh, and then Ray responds to that point. Uh, and then this is where Val does a good job. She says, no, but you're wrong because that's not what the Bible, what Paul, the inspired author of the biblical text itself, was saying. Now, I, th I think that was totally wrong, but the point here is we're arguing on the proper basis. What does the inspired text teach? And then we can go back and forth on the reasons for why we think the text sh should be read this way versus another way. In Romans 8 and 9 for Calvinism versus an Armenian understanding or a Molinist understanding or whatever. That's what atheists and skeptics should be doing. Don't be intellectually lazy and just go, the Bob Smith says this. Don't give rats patoot. Unless he's saying, unless you're presenting his reasons why he's saying that he thinks the text should be. So this is my second major point here, that the debate should be, what does the biblical text say? Atheists and skeptics, you need to get involved in the hermeneutical debates and prove if you're going to claim the Bible teaches Calvinism or the Bible teaches this understanding of sin or the, and then use that as a refutation against the truth of the Bible or against the truth of Christianity, you have to go to the biblical text and prove your interpretation is true. You have to get do the intellectual hard work of proving your interpretation of whatever proof text you're using or texts, plural, is the proper understanding. You can't just go, well, appeal to the majority or appeal to uh, common tradition or, or whatever it is, you know, majority opinion or something. Well, look at this poll, 60% of Christians say this, who cares? Uh, the majority, uh, you know, oh, well, I can, for any Christian opinion or reading of the Bible, I can point to at least one Christ, self-professing Christian in the world who says the opposite or disagrees with that. that. That is totally irrelevant and foolish, and you'll be dismissed as such if you raise that. So I will say bad job to Val on all the other points raising up, yeah, but there are people who disagree. Who cares? Um, but on the issue of Calvinism, even though I think she's wrong, she was disagreeing. Um, she's wrong on the proper basis. She was arguing that the biblical text, the authority um, for discerning which is true and what's not, um, and she was making arguments based on that. That's what we need to do. Um, and again, it's debatable. You know, obviously she screwed up. The Romans 8 and 9 does not teach Calvinism. It doesn't uh, negate free will. Uh, but 
again, that's a debate that we that we can have about what the text, the inspired text, the authority, not what Jim Bob Jones versus Bob Smith has to say. That's stupid. That's irrelevant. So that's my second point here um, that I wanted to raise. Okay, so let's move on to the third major point here. Okay, so the third issue that I have uh, with what Val said here in this show, um, it's a common athe internet atheist and skeptic trope. There's no, the no evidence uh, claim. Um, this is just a bamboozlement, but uh, in this context, Val is talking about proof for the soul and or the afterlife. So let's just hear a little, that little clip. Some physics. Are you sure, sure of that? Hmm? Are you sure of that? Yeah. Well, this is huge news because the whole world, the whole world, death is a mystery. Science doesn't know what, doesn't know what happens after death, but you know, is you're saying there's no life after death. Why would you come to that conclusion? I didn't say that. I said that what that death happens because the laws of physics require us, our bodies to wind down. There's no reason to think that there's a life after death. Um, uh, first for, uh, because um, humans, have all sorts of different uh, ideas about what that is, and um, we've never seen a scrap of evidence uh, confirming it. You believe in the soul? Nope. You know, I was talking to a university professor, university professor at UCLA, and I said one thing that made him change his mind about the soul. I asked him the same question I asked you. I said, do you believe in the soul? And uh, he was a, uh, a, a biologist, a, an evolutionary scientist at UCLA. And I said, do you, he said, no, I don't believe in the soul. I said, do you realize the Bible used the word soul and the word life synonymously? He said, really? He said, I believe in the soul then. Because obviously there is life within your body. Andrea, when you were a little four-year-old girl, you didn't look like you do now. You're a mature woman now. But that many years ago when you were four, you could look, you look completely different. But you're the same soul. You're the same personality. All this happens that you're down experience and knowledge. No, the soul is looking out of your eyes. The soul is making your voice talk. It's making your brain work. And when you no. die, your soul passes on into eternity. That's why they say you passed on. You're going to pass okay. on into eternity. That's what the Bible um, teaches. No, well, yeah, I don't. You know, I don't believe in the Bible. Uh, what's looking out of my eyes is the consciousness that my brain generates. Well, that's it. Your consciousness is your soul. That's not. But, but we have no evidence that it. Um, goes anywhere after the brain dies. Yeah, we do, because the brain is dead because the life is left. Brain doesn't work when life leaves. Eyes don't work when the life leaves. When the soul leaves the body, everything says brain dead, heart dead, everything's dead because the life is left. Now, yeah. what happens? Nope, you uh, seem to have your uh, the eggs before the chicken because... Okay, so... Uh, I'm just going to pause it uh, at this point, but you get the, the main point here is that uh, Val is just saying, look, an assertion, a certain assumed strategy, there's no evidence for the existence of the soul or the afterlife. Now, this is complete horse trash. When atheists and skeptics say this, they're either lying or they have no clue what they're talking about. Because there's a different, we have tons of evidence for the afterlife and for the soul, tons of evidence in various forms empirical evidence, historical evidence, philosophical or logical evidence as well. Um, so um, the problem here is that atheists and skeptics online don't understand uh, the difference uh, between empirical evidence, direct evidence, and the inferences or conclusions that we infer on the basis of the evidence. Right? So for example, we do have evidence. We have near-death experiences. Whether you like it or not, or agree with that or not, that's evidence for an afterlife. Now, is it persuasive evidence? Is it sufficient to conclude that there is an afterlife? Val can say, no, I don't think it is. But you can't say that, oh, there's just no evidence. There is evidence that can be used to support the hypothesis that there is an afterlife, right? So that's the main thing I want to say here is that it's misleading and dishonest to say that there's no evidence. You should say something like there's insufficient evidence to warrant the conclusion that there's an afterlife, or there is no persuasive evidence that would persuade me to conclude that the uh, that there's an afterlife, or that 
a soul exists. Uh, that's that's it. That's that's my complaint uh, there because I've encountered that a lot with atheists and skeptics who very arrogant sound very arrogant to Christians when they say just boldface. There's no evidence. It sounds like you're you're ignorant and you're not. I guarantee you, Val knows about the evidence from near death experiences and stuff like that, and she probably finds that wanting. So that's my only critique. There is just shh, again, let's try in these discussions to stop being bombastic and overly exaggerating. Let's state it truthfully, right? Look, you, you don't have evidence that persuades you or that you find sufficient to conclude that there's an afterlife or that there's a soul. Leave it at that. You know, stop saying there's no evidence. That just, you sound ignorant when you say that as an atheist or a skeptic. Um, the other thing, so she mentions one thing, um, I don't know if it was in the clip, but she does mention uh, at some point in the video, maybe it comes after this part, um, I wanted to pause it because she's getting into my next point about the chicken and the egg. But uh, in terms of this soul thing, right? Um, she, men she mentions a reason uh, that there's a lack of energy detected. So therefore there's probably no soul, we're just the brain physicalism, you know, as most, most atheists and skeptics like to go for. We're just our brain and central nervous system functioning in a certain thing. And uh, Ray Comfort is operating on a different, you know, he's talking about life and that sort of thing, life uh, as equivalent for the soul, and that's equivalent to consciousness. He's just using them all the same uh, in an unnuanced manner. And um, Val saying, yeah, but there's no detect, they're not, it's not detected. And we should expect to detect some, the creation of energy. If the soul is interacting with the brain and interacting with the body, well, why, why isn't that measurable or quantifiable in some way where we would detect energy being created from the soul when it, when I choose to do something or I feel an emotion in my soul that corresponds to a brain function. So it should be detected. Um, that's outside of the causally determined uh, sequence, physically consistent sequence, right? Um, so in the first place, number one, uh, this isn't a problem because number one, so scientists would say, look, there could be the creation of new energy and that's not a problem because that's just, first law of thermodynamics is a scientific rule that describes the way things normally happen without an outside input. And you're not allowed to assume the brain is a closed system. Um, therefore, I, as my soul, can input energy into the system anytime I want. That doesn't violate the first law of thermodynamics. Um, Val doesn't bring that up as an issue necessarily here, so that's great. But what she says is, well, if it's doing that, then we would expect to detect the energy being emitted. In the first place, that's not necessarily true. Maybe we have limits in what we're able to detect and what we're able to detect. And so there could be the creation of new energy, uh, but it's just so negligible, we're not able to detect it. Bada boom, bada bing, problem solved. Uh, what can you say there, skeptic? But secondly, um, there's another response to this, and it says, look, the creation of energy is not necessary for the soul to interact with the brain. Uh, so it's a false assumption that these atheists and skeptics have in mind, uh, where in order to interact, we have to engage physically. Well, how do we know that? Well, we have absolute scientific empirical proof that this is the case with quantum entanglement. Whoops, uh, kind of messed up there. This is proven beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, I covered this in my um, substance, sub, soul and substance dualism part four under my um, the existence of the soul series on my Real Seekers YouTube there. And there's a, a little clip where I talk about that. Modern scientific equipment. One thing I could point to here is think of quantum entang entanglement phenomena. Modern scientific evidence proves scientifically that these skeptics are out to lunch here because we know for a fact that A can cause B without the need to create any new energy in the first place. Uh, you know, these, these spin experiments um, or these slit experiments and that sort of thing have been done to prove this. It's beyond all reasonable doubt. All of these two particles are causally influencing each other because they're too far away to involve any exchange of energy, scientifically speaking. Well, it could be that there could well be that it is 
substance. Uh, dualism interaction or soul brain interactions. Mm, that's got to hurt. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm being too polemical. Sorry, but Val can take it. She's going to be going after me in the comments, I can tell. But um, the point here on a sub getting serious again. So, so the point is number one, let's say that we would expect there to be energy produced. It could be that it's so negligible what the energy produced by the soul interacting the brain that we just don't have the capability to detect it with our modern scientific equipment. It does have limits. The second is, um, in the first place, maybe it's not detected because it doesn't create energy and we would have no reason to expect it to create energy as proven by quantum entanglement, uh, where things are causally related, they causally interact as stand in cause and effect relations, and yet no energy is transferred, scientifically impossible for energy to be transferred um, or to, to engage and interact between the two things. Um, it's beyond the speed of light. So bada boom, bada bing. This is how Christians would, substance dualists would counter this kind of so-called falsification that Val brings up. Um, okay, so that's it for that point. The next point is the chicken and the egg aspect. So I think she's getting into that now. So let me just play that. Okay, so here's the next point. Uh, they get into a little debate about the chicken and the egg, and she finishes off the point about the soul. So she brings up this non-detection issue at this point. So I'll start off there just so that I include that bit. Uh, but then we're getting into this bit about the chicken and the egg. And the main uh, criticism that I have here, again, not necessarily substantive, but it's more kind of conversational. Both Ray and, this a and Val are talking past each other. And um, I think this is an issue the atheist is being a little bit manipulative and deceptive in how they're engaging with Ray here. So let's listen to that bit. Because the life is left. Now, yeah. what happens? Nope, you uh, seem to have your uh, the eggs before the chicken because the brain, whenever it shuts down, the consciousness ceases. Now, if uh, you want to uh, have something like dualism, uh, where there's a separate consciousness, soul, or whatever you want to, then we should be able to sense that and detect it because it's interacting with an electrochemical organ called the brain. Yeah, and there's no life to make it work because the life has passed on. Now, you mentioned the chicken and the egg. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The egg. Are you sure? Yep. Was it fertilized? Uh, probably in some manner. Uh, we have some uh, evidence on how uh, uh, the unicellular things ended up being polycellular and then ended up being sexual uh, for reproduction. How did it get fertilized? Um, you, need, you need a male and a female to fertilize. So obviously the chicken came first, which laid the egg. And for no. the chicken to lay a fertilized egg, it had to be a male to fertilize the egg. That's how, that's the birds and the bees, chickens and bats, were all the same. No, the eggs originally came from uh, reptiles and whenever they uh, split off into dinosaurs and then chickens came from the dinosaurs and that's where the egg came from. <laughs> Andrew, you've got blind faith to believe all that. <laughs> Okay, so, so that's good enough for the point, right? So my, my main point here is again, look, atheists and the Christian are talking past each other totally here. And I think it's because the atheist, in this case, uh, Val, was being a little bit deceptive in how she was uh, engaging with Ray, right? So Ray asks her the question about the chicken and the egg. And Ray is having a very simplistic, literal understanding. A real chicken and an egg is what they're talking about here what came first and it's obvious the answer is um the chicken uh type type deal right um but val's val saying no it's it's actually the egg but what she has in mind she's not envisioning a real chicken and a chicken's egg she's talking about she's using these words symbolically to represent you know abiogenesis or like the first cellular organisms or something like that who reproduce asexually and saying well actually no the egg came first or, and it fertilized itself asexually or or something like that you don't need a male and a female that's sexual reproduction that came you know way down the line or something millions of years after the fact or billions of years after life began um and again they're, they're just kind of talking past each other 
at this point. And I think I think they you could get into a, a discussion of abiogenesis in terms of the chicken or the egg, and you get okay, well, non-life to a living organism that would be a fruitful thing. But again, the the main point here is look, you guys have to define your terms, right? You can't talk about the chicken and the egg knowing that Ray is answering this, envisioning a real chicken and an egg. He he doesn't he's not talking symbolically about oh how the the first uh, asexual cellular organism became a sexually reproducing organism or something like that with a male and a female. Um, I think that was a little bit of a, a sly underhanded trick um, and that sort of thing. So yeah, that's, that's my take on that. Okay, so with that said, uh, I've been kind of tough on Val a little bit and trust me Val, you, you did a pretty good job. I know I'm being tough on you, but I'll say that you did a pretty good job. And for the most part on the substantive issues, I, I was kind of struggling to find criticisms to give us feedback. So, you know, that's why I'm having to resort to more kind of stylistic type things um, just so that I have something to critique, critique you on. Um, because for the most, the most part, in the format of this informal, very superficial discussion, there isn't a lot of substance for me to go after and for me to critique, um, uh, you know, in terms of what either you or Ray are saying and stuff like that. But okay, that's it. Let me try and be fair. Let me, uh, I have two bits of cri criticism or feedback for Ray Comfort. Um, so I want to get into that. And the first one is going to be a negative criticism against Ray on uh, one of Val's reasons for being an atheist based on the immor immoral, immorality of the biblical God, you know, she brings, uh, well, let me uh, go to go to the clip here. So hang on one second. With the mountains and the other thing that uh, you were saying was a problem? Uh, the, uh, basically this God, um, murdering oh, children, having no problem. Yes. Yeah, they killed David's son. Okay. Did God actually kill is it David's son or yeah, David's son when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, didn't bless him with the child. He said the child's going to die. There are repercussions to his actions. Uh, but he let Solomon live, <clears throat> which is one possible. Uh, would you be um, happy if uh, someone killed one of your children and let the other one live? No, of course not. I love all my kids. Uh, then uh, why would you accept that from your God? Oh, because he's the giver of life. He's the giver and the taker of life. And He's the one that blesses with health and and uh, and life itself. And if he's if he deems fit to take a loved one, what can I do about it? I just trust him. I trust his integrity. So let's go back to that issue. David had a son mm -hmm. that died, and God took him. And God says your child's going to die. Um, did that actually happen? Uh, did uh, did the resurrection actually happen? No. Did David have a son that no. God killed? Uh, did, um, if that didn't happen, why should I think that the resurrection happened? Oh, no, I'm not talking about the resurrection. What I'm trying to get you to say is that, did God kill the son of David? Yes. So that's, God what, the, that's, what, that's what the Bible says. Yeah, but it God. didn't happen, did it? Because you're an atheist. So you say no. it didn't happen because God doesn't exist. So why are you upset about something that didn't happen? It's like being upset uh, about the fairy godmother turning Cinderella's coach back into a pumpkin. Well, let me ask you um, if, uh, let's just say that it did happen. Okay. And uh, you, you said that you would have absolutely no problem with uh, a god doing something you would be unhappy with a human doing, correct? Oh, yeah, I'd be, I, I wouldn't be the happiest man on earth if one of my children died. But I know that God is the giver and the taker of life. He created every bone, every every drop of blood in my children. He gave me the gift of children. And if he deems it fit, then one of my ch children dies. I can't do anything about it, but I can trust him. I can trust him in it and say, Lord, you know what you're doing. You allowed this for some reason. It may not be a perfect will, but it's your permissive will. You permitted it. And in that, I rejoice. I trust you. Because that's what faith is about. It's trusting when often, often things aren't right. So um, you, you believe you have a, an objective morality from your religion, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if, uh, if it's uh, not moral for a human to do something, why is it moral for your God to do it? 
Well, let me just take the scenario and bring some reality to it. Um, everyone's going to die. Every single person's going to die. And the Bible says why they're going to die. So why be upset about something that happened two and a half thousand years ago to another man's child and say, what about my neighbors down the road who've got children that have got cancer and they're dying? What about grandma? She's dying. Grandpa, my dog dies. My parents are going to die. I'm going to die. My husband's going to die. Why not ask that question and say, what is God doing? That yeah. question has, a, has an answer. And that's the one you should pursue because the answer is incredible. Uh, why is your um, God um, allowing all these people to die whenever we, um, you know, we have this, let's say having the COVID virus, uh, we have, you know, this God, you, know, you say it's okay for this God to take anyone anytime it wants, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so your, your uh, morality is based on nothing more than might versus equals right. No, no, I don't think so. Um, I'm not saying God uh, allows people to die. God kills them. It says in scripture, the wages of sin is death. You, you remember that Bible verse, the wages of sin is death? Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that Christians can't agree on what sin is. Okay, okay, so I'm going to pause it at this point. So my criticism here, believe it or not, is going to be with, it, and I disagree with Val, I don't think God is immoral. I think that I kind of roll my eyes when I hear these these types of immoral claims of the atheists judging a morally perfect God. It, it sickens me, to be honest. Um, but I do understand their position. And I, I think that Val scored the point here. Ray, Ray Comfort's response was um, unsatisfactory for two reasons, right? So the first one is I think he was being a little bit deceptive and dishonest a bit, like a manipulative in his response by trying to say, well, hey, you're an atheist, right? So you don't believe, and Ray's not the only one. I've seen other Christians do this. My, my buddy Marvin Wallace, uh, he uses this tactic sometimes, right? And he'll say, well, hey, Mr. Atheist, you don't believe that God exists, so you don't really believe that this story is true. God didn't, in point of fact, according to you, atheist, God didn't kill anyone. So there's no immoral event that took place in history. You have no business being upset um, but that, that is dishonest. I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, that does come across as a bit dishonest, um, on the part of Christians who use that tactic because that doesn't matter, right? That we know what Val is trying to say. It's a hypothetical. It says, if God did this, then it's immoral. It's a conditional statement. And we are allowed to apply our moral conscience to fictional characters and to, um, events that are hypothetical and that didn't really occur in history. And we can make moral judgments on counterfactuals, situations or people and stuff like that. Um, so I, I just, I don't think we should use that to be honest. It, it just comes across as like a, we, a way to weasel out. And that, that's me speaking as a Christian and I like Ray Comfort. I think he's a, a great Christian apologist. Um, Yes, he's not a scholar by any stretch, um, so he has his issues, but I mean, so do I. I. He excels at things that I don't, and I like that he's out there doing his style of evangelism. I think he's helping the cause of Christ by appealing to people's consciences instead of their intelligence. I, I fully support Ray Comfort, uh, and thankfully, you know, there's also the people like William Lane Craig that supplement and appeal to people's intellect and try to go that route and bring people to Christ as well. We need both. Uh, but nonetheless, I do think that, Ray, you deserve to be scolded with that answer. But here's the second more substantive answer that he's giving, right? So Val and, and uh, Ray seem to be separating God's moral actions from human beings. And I think that this is wrongheaded, at the very least, in terms of how Val is understanding it. Um, I need to hear more. I'm not 100% certain about if Ray is saying what I think he's saying here, but there are, so in terms of morality, there are certain moral values, right? These are represented by God's morally perfect nature, and this necessarily defines what is good and evil. He is essentially morally perfect. Um, and this is the answer to the euthyphro dilemma and that sort of thing. So that 
these moral values apply to God and apply to human beings equally. There is no difference. What is, what is immoral for a human being is immoral for a God insofar as all the relevantly, relevant moral circumstances are the same. Uh, so that's the qualification there. These moral principles based on the moral values apply equally to everyone. Now, moral duties, they are issued as God's command. So those only apply to human beings, right? God doesn't have any moral duties, doesn't command himself to do anything. But these commands have to be consistent with his moral nature, with his the moral values or principles. That's where the duties derive from, and then God issues forth his commands for human beings. So again, those have to be consistent. So it's, it's all one stage. But the problem here with these examples, like God killed and stuff like that. Um, oh, okay, so, so another thing that I'll agree with Val is, uh, look, I disagree that, you know, God is the giver and taker of life. That's totally wrong. Look it up. There's not a single Bible verse that God is the taker of life. No, when God, God is no Indian giver. When he gives the gift of life, that gift belongs to you. I own my life. God gave it to me. He can't just arbitrarily take it. So if that's what you mean by taker of life, absolutely wrong. I agree with Ray fully. God does kill. There are Bible verses specifically saying God actively kills people, and there are narratives where God kills people, and I say, yep, morally perfect, great, grand, and groovy. That is so good. I can't believe that he did that. However, so, but how, how is that the case, right? Because there is a moral principle that applies to God and applies to us that says, look, when God gives a life to someone, we have a moral principle or we value, morally speaking, life and the preservation of a human life. Um, so therefore, God, God can't. It's immoral if God just arbitrarily kills David's son or kills anyone. Um, no, we need to uphold those principles unless there is a moral exemption to the moral principle of life preservation. And there is in this case of God, in this case, God is in the context of salvation history. He's trying to save as many souls as possible. He's trying to uphold other moral values in the moral hierarchy that unfortunately, because we live in a fallen world due to Adam and Eve's sin and due to our free, free choice to be sinners, um, therefore God, these moral principles come into conflict at certain times and you have to judge which ones are more weighty than the other, which ones should be upheld versus another, because no matter what you do, you're going to be uh, violating the moral principle or the moral value in question. So sometimes it's necessary to violate the moral principle of life, but it's not really a violation. It's what philosophers call an exemption to the moral principle, because moral principles have built-in qualifications whereby you have to preserve all human lives unless you have a morally justi justified reason for not doing so. And in this case, in every case in the Bible, when God kills, we're arguing, yeah, but God had a morally justified reason for killing, for not upholding the moral principle of life preservation, even though that principle still remains itself felt. It's not an exception. It's an exemption. Uh, so this is how philosophers get into it. And there's just no serious talk about, about that at all for, on anyone's side here. Um, but this is what's going on. There's a moral exemption. It isn't, oh, there's one standard for God where he's the giver and taker of life. Taker in the sense that he can just arbitrarily take life whenever he wants. No, I disagree with Ray on that. That was the wrong thing to say. Yes, God can kill, but he can only kill when there's a morally justified exemption present to that, uh, to do so. Um, and that's the same with human beings. Look, there are human beings can take life or kill a life uh, when there's a morally justified exemption as well. In war, we killed Nazis. Great, grand, and groovy. That's what we had to do. There was still that principle, but we had a morally justified reason for doing so. I'm not, the, my grandfather was not immoral for shooting down Nazi planes these scumbags over Italy trying to, or whatever it was he did as a gunner, um, you know, Nazis trying to kill innocent people. Uh, that was good. 
And it's the exact same thing with God. He had a morally justified reason. That's the discussion we need to be having about exemptions. And that applies universally. As long as the morally relevant circumstances are the same, doesn't matter whether you're God, Adolf Hitler, Dale Glover, Val, Ray Comfort, it all applies. Um, now, obviously with God, there are relevant differences, right? For example, he's omniscient. Uh, no human being is omniscient. So this means God's privy to knowledge of future circumstances, and he can take those into account in ways that human beings can't in conducting his actions to bring about certain greater goods. Uh, but in the same way, human beings do that just in a more limited extent, right? We take into account, we try to make predictions based on a balance of probabilities and within reason. And we take actions and make certain sacrifices to achieve certain greater goods as well. The only difference is with God, we have absolute proof because he's omniscient that these ends will be achieved and that they are in fact morally perfect ends that outweigh the moral costs of taking a life or, you know, telling a lie to save a life or something like that, violating the principle of truth, whatever it is. So, yeah, I, I totally disagree with, I don't think Ray answered this, this question properly and Val did a good job responding to it. The next part, uh, criticism, which is going to be positive, is for Ray Comfort. Um, is, uh, okay, so this is going to be about uh, what he says on, um, he gives an evidence in favor of Christianity. Uh, he, and he talks about how, you know, wretched, sinful wretches <laughs> like Val here will, will always use the Lord's name in vain and they'll blaspheme, you know, ever so sinfully. They'll use our Lord and Savior Jesus' name in uh, a vile manner. It's disgusting. Um, or those, you know, GD, gosh darn it. Uh, it's not only atheist skeptics, I myself have done this too, and it's just as sinful, just as wretched and disgusting when a Christian does it. Um, it's even worse, actually, because we should know better. Um, but Ray raises the interesting point of, well, how come nobody swears, uses Buddha's name as a swear word? Or how come you stub your toe, no one says, oh, Muhammad? Or, uh, <laughs> um, you know, like, oh, you know, Krishna damn you, or something like, uh, dang you, or something like that. No, it's only the Christian God, the God of the Bible, that's used as a swear word. That's proof Christianity is true. So let, let's uh, hear Ray give this argument in his own words here. Okay, so here's the two-minute clip of this point. No. 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 Download a music off the internet that's not yours? No. Never use God's name in vain. Um, yep, and I don't believe in your God, and I think it's kind of a silly character, so I don't find that any worse than, um, you know, you know, cursing by Krishna's name for, for all that matters. So would you use your mother's name as a cast word? No, and my mother's not a magical being that's claimed to have uh, moral superiority over everyone. So why wouldn't you use your mother's name as a cast word? Is it because you respect her? Yep, and I don't respect your God since I see no evidence that it exists. Boy, that's so honest of you and kind of you to admit that. The Bible says that you don't respect God, you hate him without cause, and that you're, you're in a state of enmity towards God, which is evidenced no. by the fact that you use his name as a cast word to express disgust. What greater evidence of that enmity do you have towards your creator than the fact that you use his name as a cast word? Uh, the, the evidence that uh, it's part of my culture to use uh, your God's name as a cuss word to say Jesus Christ whenever it uh, seems to be uh, you know appropriate in uh, uh, emotion, but uh, there is no particular hate there because the cuss word is essentially meaningless. Can you think of anyone in history who's had his name used as a cuss word like Hitler, Napoleon, or Mother Teresa? Anybody? No. And what exactly does that matter about your God that you can't show exists? Well, I'm just making a point, Andrea, that Jesus said why his name is used as a cuss word. He said this it's in John chapter 7. The world hates me because I testify of its deeds that they're evil. And we hate God without cause for the same reason a criminal hates a police officer. No. A, police officer a police officer is often hated and even killed 
not because of who he is, but because of what he stands for. And we hate God because he stands for righteousness and we stand for evil. And no, we, we your God is, um, I can demonstrate that your God is just as evil as anything, Ray. It works with Satan. Okay. So you get the point here. And this is a very fascinating point. It's a point that I kind of uh, thought about myself maybe when I, back when I was a Christian before I lost my face. So, you know, 12 years ago or more than 12, 13 years ago or something. But I, I kind of thought there's a similar argument, right? So Ray is saying, look, only Jesus and the God of the Bible are used as swear words by sinful wretches and atheists and skeptics today. Um, and, and including Christians, we, we sin. And sometimes I myself use the Lord's name in vain as a Christian sometimes. And that's wrong. That's sinful. It's disgusting. But Ray is saying, can you think of anybody else? Do you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No, nobody does. Uh, what about your dad's name, your brother's name? Um, anybody's name in human history? Napoleon, Hitler? Nobody uses these people as a swear word. It's only just as the Bible predicts, the God of the Bible and Jesus, no one else. And Andrea is saying, well, that's just because Jesus was a religious figure. Well, you're, in, you're invoking a curse word. His name is a curse word. What does that mean? Well, it goes back to the ancient understanding of curse you, you know. Uh, I'll just say, quote unquote, God damn you uh, is meant to be, you damn you to hell. I, I want God to damn you to hell, literally. Uh, I don't want you to be saved. Don't, and that's why it's bad to say, right? Or um, using Jesus Christ's name as a swear word or whatever, you're invoking that name to curse the other person, to have some sort of supernatural uh, negative impact on the person you're cursing. And that's what Andrea is saying here. Okay, cool. Well, then other magical figures. What about Peter? What about Moses? Nobody says Moses, you know, when they say the words MF, it's not Moses uh f word uh no it's it's mother kind of thing right but why why isn't it other religious figures uh the krishna buddha uh muhammad none of these guys are used as a curse word it's only people that are the divine being in christianity that have their names used in this way jesus and god the father just like we, uh, the Bible predicts. And that's so unique that that, according to Ray, can be used as proof for the truth of Christianity. And I, I had, there's a similar argument, the uniqueness of the Jews as a people in history uh, and you know their treatment, it's so unique. That proves Christianity has got to be true. Uh, number one, that the, the God of the Bible is true. And then given the Bible through Messianic prophecies, you can prove that Christianity is true. Um, so it's a uniqueness type argument. Now, does, uh, okay, well, is this true? What's our assessment of this? Is this a good argument to use? The fact that uh, even a, a Val here is admitting that, yeah, Christianity is unique. Only, I can't think of anyone else. I can't think of a son of a Muhammad, a son of Muhammad, or, a, you know, you, you um, instead of SOB, we call them the, the son of Buddha or something like that. <laughs> no, we, you're a son of a Buddha or something like that, right? We only use Jesus and the God of the Bible as swear words. Uh, and this is unique. Well, in the first place, it's not enough to be unique, right? Because we have to, under my G belief, our religious authenticating uh, event criteria for identifying a miraculous event of God or an event that's designed to authenticate the truth of Christianity or a religion. There are three criteria to prove that something's extraordinary. Number one, it can be mechanistic. Well, there's nothing mechanistically that shows the fact that we use Jesus' name as a cuss word today is supernatural or extraordinary, as I call it, right? It's not God designed in some way. And thirdly, um, we're just appealing to this circumstance. And the way we're trying to prove it is that it's unique. Because it's unique, it's an extraordinary event and therefore serves as a sign of God that Christianity is true. But in order to be, for this argument to be successful in proving the extraordinariness of this uh, circumstance that we use Jesus' word name as a cuss word and God of the Bible's name as a cuss word, 
It has to be unique despite there being a sufficient opportunity for duplication. And it's in that qualification where the real substantive debate would take place. So number one, is it true that it's unique? Well, Val has admitted for the sake of argument at least, that yeah, it is unique. Um, is that true? We would need to actually investigate that beyond just having a, you know, an atheist, a funnily atheist uh, say that it's true, but it's it definitely seen, I can't think of anyone. Um, there's certainly no other religious figure uh, in the modern world that I'm aware of. Uh, but then again, have we studied? Did we did we actually go to other cultures? What about historically? Is it unique historically? So for example, uh, HBO's Rome. They, these guys are a bunch of satanic heathens and pagans. And um, they use, uh, you know, sons of dis or something as a swear word, as a cuss word, this being a pagan god. So, okay, well, what about the ancient Romans or the ancient Greeks or ancient Hindus or ancient uh, Parthians, Parthians and stuff that, you know, oh, Zoroaster you or something like that. Uh, we would need to assess that. Is it actually unique historically as well as just in today's modern world? Um, so th that's the first part is we need to actually uh, prove that it is unique. Secondly, uh, if it is unique, has there been a sufficient opportunity for duplication? And you would you would say, of course. I mean, look at all the religious figures out there. Look at all the people, gods and goddesses throughout history, where whereby we could have transformed their names into a, a swear word, and that would be preserved into modern language, or something like that, right? Or or would have been used by the people at the time, at least, as a cuss word, and and. Uh, that would seem to say, well, yeah, we've had sufficient opportunity. Now, what Val's response is, is she's saying, she mentioned the thing of culture. And she's saying, well, look, other cultures don't use religious figures like that. So actually, it's not a sufficient opportunity because the same cultural circumstances that produced this effect of using Jesus or the God of the Bible's name as swear words didn't apply in other cultures. So they're, they're irrelevant to the calculation, right? Um, so yeah, in that case, we would need to look at, okay, cultures that are relevant. We would need to debate that. Are, are, is the fact that no one uses Krishna's, Krishna's name in, in India as a swear word, is, is that, does that constitute a relevant category similar enough to Jesus to say, yeah, there's been a sufficient opportunity? Uh, well, no, that, they had a radically different culture, according to Val. So, okay, if that's the case, great. Then we need to look at, well, what about the similar cultures? And I think that's where we would get into, well, where did Christianity arise? You, you know, using Jesus' name as a cuss word that arose in Judaism and the Roman Empire. So we would look at that immediate area and say, well, did ancient Romans use pagan gods as cuss words in the same way that uh, we do? Uh, we know that uh, Christians did swear or that the pagans had filthy mouths because Paul warns Christians not to be like these heathens and not to swear, right? That's a sin if you use foul language. Uh, but nonetheless, were any of these uh, filthy cuss words, you know, invoking the name of one or more of their gods and goddesses in the same way that we invoke Jesus' name or, or God the Father's name as a cuss word today? Um, that's what you would need to do. You would need to do that, um, that kind of historical assessment, I think, and cultural, you know, make sure all of the relevant facts are sufficient to, to constitute, yes, look, we've analyzed all the relevant religious figures and God and divine beings. Only Jesus is unique in this way, Jesus and God, the Bible. And furthermore, we have a sufficient sample size to say there's been a sufficient opportunity for duplication in these other contexts. Now, let's say we establish all of that. I think there's something to this argument then. I think you could say that the fact that we use Jesus' name as a cuss word is extraordinary and could therefore serve as a sign from God, a G-belief authenticating event, or otherwise known as a religious authenticating event, a miracle of God attesting to the truth of Christianity. Um, there could be something there. It's, it's just a matter of somebody doing the work, which I have not, um, of looking, of establishing that there has been a sufficient opportunity, 
making sure they're using the relevant reference class to establish that uh, sufficient sample size. Uh, you know, so if culture is, is the reason, is where we derive our usage of Jesus' word as a cuss word in this way, great. Look at the similar culture, the ancient Romans, the pagan world, the Jews of the time, and see if they used um, divine beings and or religious figures as cuss words in the same way as we do with God and Jesus, uh, the God of the Bible and Jesus. Um, if not, then yeah, you can argue it's unique and there has been a sufficient opportunity. Um, and it seems to go through. This would make it an extraordinary unique thing on the basis of its uniqueness. It, it's weird. Why would the Bible be correct in predicting that people would use Jesus' name in this way and only Jesus in this way? You know, nobody else, no, there's no swear words, uh, you know, oh, you stupid little son of Poseidon. Um, no, these don't exist. So it, there could be something here. I don't think we should just dismiss this argument as though it's nonsense, but it's clear that more needs to be done to, number one, establish that it is in fact unique, and uh, both, not just in our world today, but also uh, historically as well. And then secondly, that we, once we've established all of the relevant parameters for the formation of this event, in this case, using Jesus' word, name, and the God of the Bible's name as a cuss word, um, that there's been a sufficient opportunity for a duplication in another religious context or something like that. And that would, if there had, let, you know, let's say there were a bunch of people in Jesus' day or something who used uh, God, this is God Zeus, Zeus's name as a cuss word. Okay, well then it's not unique then. And then you, it can't be used as a sign of God. Uh, it's not extraordinary in any way. And therefore it isn't a sign of God that Christianity is true. We can just conclude with Val that yeah, culture explains it. It was just a cultural development and the circumstances at that time are what fully naturalistically account and explain uh, the formation of this uh, cultural occurrence in our societies today. It has nothing to do with God. It, we can't prove it's a God-designed event for the purpose of attesting to the truth of Christianity. But if it is, oh my goodness, you atheists, you're in a world of hurt. We have even more proof that uh, the Bible is correct and that uh, the God of Christianity is true. Um, okay, so, so that's it. Um, my final point, turning back to my assessment of Val is right towards the end, they talk about some of the, the commenters were mentioning, you know, Val comes off as a very prideful or arrogant person. And Ray comes back and says, look, you need to humble yourself or whatever. So I just wanted to go through that kind of ending thing and then give my take on that. And that was, that'll be it for my points of review. So let's go to that part. Okay, so here's the clip here. Choice in the matter. Jesus also said that he could use parables to make sure that some people couldn't accept him. Yeah, you know what that's about? The Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Jesus said, I thank you, O Father, that you've hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. So if you refuse to have a humble seeking heart, you'll never find the truth. You open a Bible and start looking for things that you can do to accuse God of moral discrepancies, you'll never find the truth. But if you've got a humble searching heart and say, God, I'm going to die. I need you to, I need you to live. And I know you're rich in mercy and you're a lover of my, and you're the lover of my soul. Please leave me in all truth. And he will, he's faithfully promised. He says, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you search me with your whole heart. Let me finish that. He said, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you search me with your whole heart. So remember that God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. And a proud person doesn't realize they're proud. They're blinded by their own pride. So Search your own heart and say, have I got a proud heart or am I humbly seeking truth and wanting to please the God that gave you life? I was, um, whenever I first read the Bible, uh, the, I was um, in the midst of losing my faith. And so I prayed and asked this God to uh, help me. And uh, this has been, well, a handful of decades ago. Uh, this God did absolutely nothing, right? So uh, trying to blame the uh, victim doesn't really work here. Okay, let me answer that. God sometimes takes his time. 
the day to the Lord is a thousand years to us, and God is answering that prayer today. And I'm trying to help you to restore your faith. So you thank God that He chooses foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. He speaks through donkeys. He's speaking through me today and telling you that He has no pleasure in your death, and He's answering your prayer and He wants to restore your faith. Okay. Um, other Christians have told me the same thing, although somewhat different because um, you know Christians have their own invention of what this God wants. And uh, to try to claim that it, your God takes decades to answer a prayer, that doesn't work with the Bible either, since it uh, it says that basically knock the door shall be opened. It doesn't say uh, wait until your late middle age to uh, hear from someone. It doesn't tell you how quickly the door will open. It just says knock and it shall be opened. Sometimes God takes his time. Scripture makes that very clear. The, the scripture says that uh, the knock and the door shall be opened because the person is not going to let the the uh the person in the house is to let the uh the visitor stand outside well keep knocking andrea god loves you i love you i care about you and your parents love you and i want to thank you for your uh the fact that you're a good sport and you, you let me speak and I, I trust that you're going to think about what we talked about today okay so so that's it here so this is the last point that i wanted to end off on it's the last point they ended off on and the issue of Val as an atheist being very arrogant and prideful and haughty and uh, against God. And this is why she's an atheist today. This is why she doesn't believe. Obviously, in response, Val is, is uh, not appreciating that and saying, ah, this is just to be dismissed. This is just Christianese uh, nonsense and BS. Uh, and then she gives her own personal anecdote about how uh, you know, she was knocking at the door decades ago, and God never answered. So, um, in the first place, let's uh, let's take a look at the Bible verse because Val says uh, something that's totally wrong, right? So, Ray is is right here that we have to have a humble heart. In Matthew chapter seven, uh, verse starting verse seven to twelve, uh, which is the verse they're talking about here. Uh, you know, at knock and it shall be opened, ask and you'll, you'll receive and, and stuff like that. Um, we have to keep this in context and they're, they're not, right? So Val, atheists aren't. Uh, so in the first place, they're making up, making stuff up that, oh, it'll just happen right away. And Ray's saying, no, it'll be open, but it'll take time. So Val makes this statement saying, no, it says it'll be opened right away. There's, it doesn't say open when you're middle-aged or something like that. It'll say you'll be open right away because God wants to give you what you need at that time or something. So let's see what the Bible verse itself actually says here and see if what Andrea says is true. Okay, so, so notice the title here, Keep Asking. Mm. Keep Seeking, Keep Knocking. So Number one, verse six, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. So right away, this is proving that God does not open the door for everyone. He does not answer everybody's prayers if they're sinful, if they're not real seekers. He doesn't do anything for them. Uh, and then, it, then we get into the verse that they're quoting, ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be open to you huh thou lied to us where's the little part at the end where it says it'll be opened right away for you because we don't want you standing outside it it doesn't say that that was a lie very dishonest um and then it go you know for everyone who seek who asks receives everyone who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be open again i, I don't where does it say and it'll be open that instant uh, it'll be open within two seconds. Uh, I don't see it. That was a lie. Um, you know, or what man among you in the, goes into talking about how we as human beings give uh, the proper what people need. Notice it's bread. It's using, um, would you give your son a stone instead of bread? No, you give them bread. It doesn't say a fancy feast. If you ask your father for a fancy feast, he may not give that to you. It may not be good for you. He gives you just the bare basics, bread, uh, fish, something for you to survive, what you need. And that's exactly the context here. This is what God gives us. It's a prayer of dependence, according to biblical scholars like Dr. Craig Keener, one of the world's experts in this area. And he's written an actual commentary on Matthew. 
Um, so this is a prayer of dependence. You trust in your faith that God will give you what you need, not what you want in all instances, just what you need. And part of what you need is him opening the door to people who are actually seeking, who are really seeking the truth. And for them, he'll open the door and you'll come to saving faith because that's something you need. But there's no temporal qualifier here. Bell lied. No, Ray Comfort was right. It says it will be open to you before the point of no return, before you are, will be prevented from getting what you need from God. If you need salvation from God, keep knocking, keep seeking for the rest of your life before that point of no return, whenever that is. And then he will open it to you. But it's important to note that so, so Ray Comfort is correct here, actually, and Bell was, is just making stuff up. In real life, she wasn't getting a prayer of dependence, it seems. It was more a prayer of testing God, saying, give me the proof right now, or we're through. And this is a problem I find with a lot of skeptics. They're, they're not really, in the first place, you have to ask, are they even really seeking God in the first place? Um, you know, a lot, a lot of and Val gave her testimony, look, I was searching decades ago, and we're just supposed to believe them. David Johnson says the same thing, all the SNS skeptics, they, they say the words, they parrot the words, I was seeking, notice it's always past tense. So now you're not a real seeker. That's your fault. You should not have stopped seeking, and you'll go to hell because of that. That's your fault, your problem. You should have kept seeking, kept depending on God, kept being a real seeker towards God, no matter what, just because you didn't get it that, at that time, you should have remained dependent on God. You didn't. That's why you're going to hell. Um, so, so there's that interesting little take that skeptics are impatient. They test their God. It's a falsification test. You have five months. You know, I remember David Johnson on Skeptics and Seekers. He did a farcical little, you know, I'm going to be testing an honest search for God uh, for one month only. And only in the specified ways that I'm willing to do, not in the ways Dale gave that would actually bring him, help him and address him in his issues. I don't want to seek God in those ways. God's got to reveal himself on my terms, and he's got a one-month time limit. If he doesn't reveal myself, ha, that proves he's not real, uh, as though it's a prayer of falsification test. No, that's not what you do. That's the wrong spirit. Now, I'm not saying that's what Val had. I, I literally know nothing about Val decades ago, and uh, whether she was a real seeker at any point, in life, maybe she was. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, are one today. And if you're not one, um, I suspect that Val is not. I will admit, I haven't, I, I would like more details, because I'm not good at reading people and making judgments. I, I try to wait and accumulate enough data I do have some data points from Val uh, that I, I would probably, if I had to choose one, I would say she's not a real seeker today. Um, but again, I'm uncomfortable saying that because I, I could be wrong. Um, I highly, I, I doubt it based on what I know, but what I know is I would like more bit data points to accumulate first before I would say, yes, you're not a real seeker. In the same way with David Johnson, I have enough or with, Sarah Watt, the SNS, a lot of the SNS skeptics, I have enough at this point to say, yep, they're not real seekers on a balance of probabilities. I don't have 100% knowledge, but you know, it's, uh, it's fairly strong uh, level of credence that they're not real seekers. I can't claim that because I don't have as much uh, knowledge or interaction with Val, so I can't confident claim, yeah, she probably is a real, not a real seeker. Um, but I do have all the data points that I have so far do seem to indicate that. Okay, who cares? That's me psychoanalyzing people. Forget about that. The point is, Val, you would know. You know yourself. Are you really seeking today? Are you truly open-minded to learning the truth that the God of the Bible is, is real? Um, or you, will you reject him no matter what because of his evils, killing David's son if, for example, are you willing, are you open to learning that was cool, that was morally perfect, that was great, that was a good thing that God did? If not, then you're not a real seeker today, and it's your fault that you'll be going to hell. 
God isn't going to open the door for someone like you? Are you actively seeking? Meaning, are you doing the active work uh, yourself um, to the best of your ability within reason? Obviously, you, not everyone's a scholar. Not everyone has the same resources. Not everyone has the same time time resources some you know people have to take care of kids they have to they have lives to lead in addition to the search but not using that as an excuse to just totally neglect it no do it to the best of your ability maybe devote two hours a week to, to studying things or something like that are you actively seeking whatever's within reason for you and you and god no that's where I have a little bit of doubt uh, or a little bit of data points with Vel because, uh, you know, for example, they, they just automatically dismissed my cosmological argument uh, over 12 hours of content just for the one argument for God's existence, extremely detailed and well-researched. And Vel was just automatically saying how, how I was lying and how stupid I was as a Christian in terms of the science of cosmology um, without even looking or giving the specific points first you know first if you're a real seeker and actively seeking god if you're really actively knocking on that door you're gonna okay let me listen to what he says first and then i'll say oh well you don't know what you're talking about in science because uh you know here at this at this time stamp you said this about this model that's that's totally wrong. It's so grossly wrong that it shows that you have zero understanding or something. And it's got to be substantively truthful, right? Like you can't just make up criticisms and exaggerate and stuff like that. Uh, that's what I would expect if you're truly a real seeker for God. Um, alternately, uh, Val, not Vel, V-E-L, not the one we're evaluating here, but Val the atheist, V-A-A-L, the guy. Uh, I've had him on my show a few times. With my cosmological argument, he's not a real seeker. Remember, he said, I will never, uh, on the SNS boards back when we were talking, he's like, I will never uh, consider anything from science from a Christian. Just biased, closed-minded. He's not a real seeker. He's just automatically dismissed. Anything from a Christian can't be true. Uh, I will only listen to a biased atheist tell me what's what in terms of science or cosmology. Uh, so yeah, you, that's not being a real seeker, right? That's kind of, that's, you're not actively seeking. And then finally, uh, in addition to being open and actively seeking, you also have to be willing to obey and to, and or follow that truth. In, in other words, the Christian God in whatever way is appropriate, worship and, and you know, following him, placing your faith, repenting uh, towards that truth. Would, it, would Andrea qualify for that? Did she qualify for that decades ago? Would you would you seriously be willing to follow a God who kills David's son or to send people to hell? Or, I mean, you, you mentioned in the show you had a problem with um, the Jesus uh, sacrifice on the cross, the atonement, you know, penal substitution aspect of the atonement is morally reprehensible, you said in the show. I didn't play that clip, but it was in the show. Um, Okay, great. So is that, does that mean the game, game over? You, you would not worship a God who sacrificed his son, God the son on the cross for your sins, experienced hell for you? Uh, well, if you're closed-minded in that way, if it's game over, you're not a real seeker. You're not knocking at the door. And that's what we have to ask. And atheists and skeptics need to be honest with themselves. It's so easy to delude ourselves. And that's the purpose of Jesus' parables. That's what Ray is saying here, that uh, we often delude ourselves into thinking we're real seekers when we're not. It's, it's a hard standard to meet for human beings. We so often get wrapped up in our biases. It's so easy to fall into an entrenched way of thinking. Even for Bible-believing Christians, this happens. Um, you know, sometimes I feel it happening to me, even after my conversion, with certain things. Um, you know, and not to call it any names, but let, let's just say, you know, my, my friend, Christian Teddy, Teddy Pappas or something, um, she's an Eastern Orthodox, which is a foreign religion to me. I'm a sola scriptura, Bible-believing Protestant Christian. I was raised Baptist. I, I'm pretty hardcore into that, but I've got to sometimes check myself and well, maybe the Eastern Orthodox or Catholic understanding might be right or have at least some certain right points. 
and I have certain wrong understandings on some things. So I need to continuously be a real seeker, even after I uh, found out the truth and achieved salvation. Uh, nonetheless, I, I have to continue through sanctification. I still have to be a real seeker, even after I've discovered the truth that's sufficient for my salvation, because God wants me to continue to grow. That's a part of my salvation is sanctification as well and can, doing my best to learn and grow in Christ as much as possible. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that that's the point that I would want to say. Like, I, I noticed that's a common thread with atheists and skeptics. It's always, well, I was a seeker and I didn't get it at the time or in the form. I didn't get the answer that I wanted or expected. And therefore I've given up on him and I'm no longer a real seeker. And that's the sense that I'm getting from Bell. And that's what Ray Comfort is calling out and saying, well, look, you know, keep knocking, keep knocking, keep being a real seeker. Don't just give up. Who cares if you're a middle age? You could be an old fart. God can save a 95 year old. Um, you know, the Bible makes it clear that at the very least up until the point of death, you have every chance to, to be saved. So that is the point of no return from the biblical perspective. And it's the Bible that we care about. You know, she appeal, Val appear, appeals to what other Christians say. They have different interpretations. Again, who cares? Who cares? It's what the Bible says. The, Bible's, the Bible makes it perfectly clear explicitly that you have until death. You're not dead yet. So keep knocking. Um, the Bible is crystal clear that it's not saying you will get everything you want, your prayers answered exactly the way you want. No, it's saying God will give you what you need. That's the point about the bread and the stone. He's giving you the basic necessities of life, what you need for you and to accomplish God's providential plan, a salvific plan for everybody in creation as a whole. And that's the context here. It's not saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm knocking at the door and I want a lavish feast. God, why don't you give me gold-plated uh, dishes and, and a pearl worth a million bucks, you know, the same one that Cleopatra allegedly had, but, you know, historically didn't have, and claimed she dissolved a, a pearl worth a million dollars uh, in today's money in a wine cup and drank it just to prove how rich she was. No, that's not what the Gospel of Matthew is saying. That's foolish. That's you not really looking for the truth. That's you just being biased, having an agenda, and you want to destroy the refute the bible no matter what you're looking for a falsification test and you're not making a prayer or a, a sincere knocking asking or seeking um in a dependent way which is what matthew chapter 7 is all about it's a prayer of dependence dependence on who dependence on god total submission and trust that he will give you what you need when you need it in accordance with his plan providential uh, plan of salvation. That's that's what this verse is talking about in context. If you read all of the Bible and all of the gospel, it's clear and it's just obvious. Everyone with a functioning brain who's being honest, not lying to themselves, would agree with me and Ray Comfort on this front and not Bell, right? Because we know that there's no temporal thing that says God has to reveal himself to you immediately. Everybody knows. It's just obvious. Look at Paul. He had to wait three years. Nobody was going around saying, oh, but yeah, but God should have revealed himself to Paul three years ago. Why did he wait three years and then reveal himself on the road to Damascus? It's too late. Oh, no, Christianity can't be true. Come on. Foolish, foolish. Nobody would believe, oh, pray, pray, ask, and you'll receive. Oh, okay, I just prayed for a sports car and never got it. You want, that's not what Matthew has in mind. That's obvious. Matthew himself prayed for stuff. I mean, as a human being, you know, absolute historically proven fact christians prayed for things didn't get them so he wouldn't be that dumb to write 80 years later after praying every day and getting and praying for stuff that he didn't get at certain times instead he only got what god what he needed in accordance with god's providential plan um he wouldn't say oh pray and you'll get whatever you want i know i prayed and didn't get my sports car after all but uh, i'm telling every every christian if you pray for your sports car god will give it to you Come on now. Come on. That's that's ridiculous. Anyways, that's that's it. That's it for my review. I've been uh, talking way too long. So thanks for listening and uh, have a great day. I, I hope that uh, value appreciate this review. 
yes, I was being a little polemical. So you're free to be a bit polemical back to me in the comments and I'll, I'll just take it because uh, yeah, this is one-sided, so fair's fair. Um, but that said, uh, outside of the polemic, like I said, um, I, at certain times I was kind of straining to try and find uh, certain points, uh, substantive points to tackle you with um, in terms of like your first, a lot of the substantive points I, I kind of agree with you. I, I'm, on, I'm on your side in terms of the morality and, and you know, the take on that about how moral principles apply to God and human beings equally. Um, uh, given that there's the same morally relevant facts or factual circumstances that play. Um, I agreed with you on the old earth versus young earth issues. Um, and I, I just tried, I tried to come up with some sort of criticism on stylistic grounds, uh, you know, with my sort of criticisms of you. Um, but yeah, I, I think for what this talk was, I think you did pretty good. I was actually impressed. Uh, you did better than I was thinking. I was expecting a horrible performance, something along the lines of uh, Darren Lute or David Johnson from Skeptics and Seekers. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, nah, but I, I think, I, you know, something like Darren Lute, but um, I think you did better. You, you did, for what this was, you did respond on point. Uh, you came up with relevant counterpoints to some of what Ray was saying. Again, whether I agree or disagree with, with you on those counterpoints, at least they were relevant. Uh, relevant ones. Um, and yeah, my, my main take, I just wish it was a more in-depth convo, like maybe have less quantity of points and a, a more qualitative discussion on like two or three of the specific points. You agree in advance and then you go into a little bit more back and forth on those points and stuff like that. But other than that, I, I think both of you did a great job representing your sides. Uh, it was a good short discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, Ray, Ray's right and you're not, uh, period. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's it. So I'll shut up and yeah, I hope you appreciated the uh, review. So have a great day.